And, but there are a couple other uh, members that have RSVP. So it's up to you whether you want to start. Um, I think we should start. The agenda seems pretty full. Um, and hopefully the others who said they were coming will join quickly. Um, welcome everybody. This is the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission meeting on um, December 13th. We have scheduled to run from nine to one and hopefully we'll be done um, before then. We'll do our best. It's a busy time for everybody. Um, roll call first. Great. Juan? Yes. Juan, I'm also happy to do the um, housekeeping oh, items. That's right. Kim, would you mind if Danielle does that? Yeah, I, was, I wasn't sure which order you wanted to do that in. Okay, that's right. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Danielle. <laughs> yeah, the cautionary course. message. <laughs> Welcome, Commission members, liaisons, and members of the public to today's Legal Services Trust Fund Trust Commission Fund. meeting. Thank you for joining us. We are using Zoom with the goal to foster a more inclusive environment and effective meeting. If you would like to comment during the meeting, please use the raised hand feature. To use the raise hand feature by phone, dial star nine on your phone's dial pad. That will raise your hand and you can use the same command again, star nine to lower your hand. Please utilize this tool to virtually indicate that you would like to speak in order to help the chair facilitate the discussion. Going forward, all commission and committee meetings will be recorded and posted to the State Bar website. And a friendly reminder that this is a video conference. So to please be aware of your surroundings behind you. Some quick troubleshooting tips for those using Zoom on a computer, when on mute, holding down the space bar will temporarily unmute you. If you use your phone to dial into this meeting, please be sure your computer's microphone is on mute to avoid audio feedback issues. And while joining audio via computer is highly recommended, if an individual loses audio, they can call in separately using the Zoom conference number. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. And that was perfect timing because I see more people have joined. Um, Juan, roll call, okay. please. Great. Rhinus? Here. Savage? Here. Scharber? Here. Vanarelli? Aglagi? Alcera? Amin, are you? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't know. Um, Ball? Yeah. Fight Master? Luis, are you here? Bennett? Here. Blakemore? Here. Rochelle? Present. Connolly? Erica Connolly? Friedman? Galkin? Here. Miskin? Here. Oh, Eric? Here? Yes. I, yeah. Oh. Yeah. I, okay. I, I'm, I apologize. I don't know if I should sign on to sign off if you're still hearing the echo. Cruz? Here. I think the echo um, starts when it's unmuted. Sorry, Eric. Okay. Oh, it's, okay. Cruz? Here. Lee, Joseph Lee, Mahoney? Here. Mann? Here. Meeker? Here. Plantold? Here. Judge Yaskell? Here. Justice Murray? Judge Seligman? I'm here. Uh, I apologize. I'm going to have to check in on out because I have a bunch of uh, fires burning today. Okay, thank you, Judge Solomon. We have quorum. Kim, would you like me to do um, liaisons and staff now? Sure, that would be great. Thank you. Selena Copeland? Present. Bonnie Huff? Elizabeth? Here. Danielle? Here. Chris is there? Brady? Brady's not here today. Okay, great. So I just hand it back over to you, Kim. Okay. I'm here for the Mel Melanie. Are you Melanie? Are you here for oh. uh, Bonnie? I am. For the okay, you're here in lieu of a Bonnie. Okay, great. Okay. Is I Bonnie see. coming too, Melanie? Do you know? I'm not sure, but okay. um, I, I will be taking over some of the duties. Uh, okay. So you'll be seeing me a lot more um, and possibly her some less. So, okay. anyways. <laughs> and it looks Thanks. like Justice Murray joined as well. Oh, great. Hi, Justice Murray. 
I, Melanie, we're happy to see you here as a former commissioner. It's nice to see you again. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. So with all my friends. <laughs> okay. Um, anybody on the line, Danielle, for public comment? There's um, a couple of people. There's a person calling in from a 530 uh, phone number. I'm not sure who that is. There is a Kara King from Disability Rights and Zach Newman from LAC. Nobody okay. has their hand raised. No one has their hand raised? Kim, are you, can they still raise their, raise their hand from the attendee or do we have to unmute them to make sure? We have to, I, I have to unmute them if they want to talk, but they can raise their hand okay. following the directions uh, Danielle read earlier. Okay. Great. Okay, so there are no hand raised for public comments at this time. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, we wanted to have a little uh, quick staff introduction because that did not happen at the November meeting. So um, Danielle, can we just start with you? Sure, um, I am Danielle McCray. I joined the Office of Access and Inclusion in July of this year. Uh, so I'm relatively new to the office. Um, is there any other fun facts that you would like me to share or is that sufficient? Um, any particular charges that you have or areas you're focused on? Sure, yeah, that, that is a great one. I am working with Chris McConkey on the Homelessness Prevention Funds grants. And I also have been working on the attorney impact survey um, on the DEI side of the house. Super, thank you. Of course. Uh, Elizabeth? Morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Hom. I co-lead the office so along with Dawn. Um, and while you, uh, Dawn leads our grants administration work, I lead our diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Um, though I do have my hand in um, a lot of grants administration as well. So you, you do see me pop in and out. Um, I've been with the state bar uh, just over four years now. Um, and prior to joining the state bar, I was a legal aid attorney for 13 years. Great, okay, uh, Dan. Hi, um, I'm Dan Passamatic. I am uh, also a senior grants administrator. I have a, a pretty diverse portfolio. I do a lot of grants administration and uh, monitoring, but also we'll be talking to you today about uh, some uh, rules committee recommendations and uh, also am the staff coordinator for the bank grants committee. So been here for 20 years. If uh, the question has to do with historical practice, uh, I may be helpful. Great. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Duan, before I get to you, am I missing anybody else? I think everybody's in my picture. Yeah, Chris was um, as an attendee, so unless he pops back, then um, we can allow him to talk if Chris, maybe, um, as well as Crystal. What Is about Crystal, Kim, and and Kimberly, Kimberly, maybe? And Kimberly, too. Yeah. Yes. Hi, thanks, Kim, uh, for unmuting me. This is Chris McConkey. Hi, everybody. Good morning. I'm an um, acting program supervisor in the Office of Access and Inclusion. I have the pleasure of uh, co-presenting to you later today with Danielle um, and Duan. Um, and I am the committee coordinator for the Homelessness Prevention Grants Committee. Um, so welcome to the uh, uh, newer commissioners. Kimberly. Hi, I'm Kim Wormsley. Uh, um, I'm a program specialist in of sex and inclusion. I mainly I do a lot of things, but my main job is uh, supporting all the uh, staff meetings and everything. And I have been with the state bar 21 and a half years now. <laughs> Kim is the person I'm always messaging going, what, what was the time for that? What was she's like, <laughs> always like on it. <laughs> okay. Um, and there's Crystal and Erica too that are as attendees of the. Um, okay. If you don't mind promoting okay. them. Can we get a quick. From the, uh, yeah, I'm not seeing them. So. Um, I think I'm unmute, unmuted. This is okay. Crystal Bending. Are. Okay, great. Yeah, good, good morning, everyone. I'm Crystal Bending. I'm a senior program analyst with the Office of Access and Inclusion. I've been with the bar for uh, a little over seven years, but with ONI for the last two and a half. Uh, I'm the primary staff contact for the partnership grants, and then also will be presenting a little uh, later on in this meeting regarding the legal aid grant evaluations um, regarding EAF and partnership grant. 
Um, Thank you, Crystal. And er is Erica on? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Good morning, everybody. I'm Erica Carroll. I'm an acting program supervisor with the Office of Access and Inclusion. I've been with the State Bar about two and a half years. Prior to that, I was a legal aid attorney. Um, and on the grants administration side, I am the committee coordinator for the Eligibility and Budget Review Committee, which deals with the IL-10 EAF administration. So nice to meet you all. Thank you. Uh, Dwan. Hi, everyone. Um, you know me, Dawn Wing. Um, I co-lead the, the office with Elizabeth. And as Elizabeth said, I, I manage the grants, as you all know. Um, I saw, I'm also the staff coordinator for the executive committee, the rules committee, and the soon-to-be-formed nominations committee. Um, I've been at the state bar for about six and a half years now. Um, and prior to coming, I was also a legal aid attorney. Um, I practice at um, a support center as well as a QSP. So um, it has been really gratifying to be in this position and to now work with so many legal aid organizations throughout California. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, now that we've done some intros, we have to say uh, goodbye to several commissioners. Um, Zahira is um, moving on. Uh, she's been on the commission since 2019. Uh, she's currently on eligibility and budget and previously was on the rules committee. Uh, Zahira, many of us have um, really relied on getting a very clear perspective from you on different topics that have come up. We've really appreciated having you. You've got a really strong background. You were um, always have always been very involved as commissioner. And um, so we, we thank you for that and um, wish you the best of luck. And thank you so much. Justice Murray, um, you have been with us since 2013 and um, you were on partnership grants and then you also participated in the working group on expungements, which was kind of within the rules committee's work. And, um, you know, like Zahira, you've really been an active member and contributed well. And I think in many instances gave us really excellent counsel on, on how to move forward. So we will, we will really miss you. If either of you ever have the opportunity to come back, um, please, please think about that. Um, we really like having a, a, a diverse group of people with different perspectives. So we, we thank you for your time very much. Um, consent items. Uh, hey, Chris has his hand up. Um, oh. Him. Oh, yeah, thanks. I, if you'll just indulge me, I, I mean, Zahira has many years of practice ahead, and I know uh, there will be lots of successes in her future. And, uh, but Justice Murray, I did want to just uh, recognize we came on the, on the commission, I think, at the same time. And I've really enjoyed, uh, enjoyed your contributions and you're off to retirement, which I I certainly wish you the best for. I uh, will miss your uh, your thoughtful book recommendations over the years. I've taken I've taken every single one of them. So um, I hope you have many years ahead of uh, of reading great literature and really just enjoying uh, the time that you get with retirement. Thank, Thank you. That motion. Thank, Thank you, Chris. Um, it's been a, a really good run, uh, and I've really enjoyed uh, working with this group the last, uh, well, since 2013. Um, I've had my hands in a lot of different organizations, a lot of different committees, and this has been one of the most gratifying for sure. When I was first uh, asked to join the uh, committee, <clears throat> the, the former person in my position said, well, don't worry about it. It's only four meetings a, a year, and you know, you just yeah. <laughs> and I don't. <laughs> maybe that was the case back then. I'll give her the benefit of the doubt, but um, certainly it's been a lot of work, but but it's extremely gratifying. And I I wish this group all the best going forward, uh, working with all of um, all of the people in California that that need legal uh, services and. I'm uh, <clears throat> hoping to get back into this a little bit later, maybe on land on somebody's board somewhere um, after I have a little period of convalescence. But uh, 
Thanks again, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you. We'll miss you, Bill. Thank you. <laughs> and I just want to say uh, thank you both on behalf of the staff. Um, Justice Murray, you have been really invaluable in partnership grants, and you've been so many meetings on the expungement and has really guided us um, that work to, to have a statutory change. And Zihira, I mean, your, your nonprofit management um, kind of background has really, really helped shape the Eligibility Budget Review Committee. And you'll see uh, one of the, the uh, working groups that Zihira helped with in the Rules Committee, the culmination of that working group, this recommendation is coming before you today. And it was the culmination of a year's worth of work. So we thank you so much uh, for your contributions and, and please do come by and stop and say hi. And if you ever want to rejoin, um, do reach out. Thank you. You know, I, I think we would also welcome Justice Murray's um, future book recommendations. So feel free to send those on to us also. I'll have a little bit more time to, to um, preview those for you. I, I will do All right. that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, can we move on to consent items? So moved. <laughs> okay, I just. All right, so the. Um, sorry, my computer just misbehaved. Okay, so the first is um, approval of the um, meeting summary and action items for the August 13th, 2021 meeting. Is there any discussion on this? Are we ready to uh, approve this? Hearing nothing, I'm going to assume so. Um, did I already hear something from Bob? Yeah, so moved. <laughs> so moved. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay. Okay, great. I'll do roll call. Okay. <clears throat> Rhinus? Yes. Savage? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Vanarelli, Aglagi, Asaraf, Ball? Yes. Fightmaster, Bennett? Yes. Blakemore? Yes. Bushelli? Yes. Connolly? Friedman? Galkin? Stay. Iskin? Yes. Cruz? Yes. Lee? Yes. Great. And I have you noted as present too. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you. Mahoney? Abstain. Mann? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Plantle? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Um, now we'll move on to the second consent item, approval of the meeting summary and action items for November 17th, 2021. Any, Ditto, so moved. Um, we'll hold that for a second. Any, any comment from anyone? All right, Bob has moved. Do we have a second? Second. How do you roll call? Rhinus? Yes. Savage? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Vanarelli, Aglagi, Al Saraf, Ball? Abstain, I was not there. Fightmaster? Bennett? I'm sorry, yes. Blakemore? Yes. Bushelli? Yes. Connolly, Friedman, Galkin? Stain. Iskin? Yes. Cruz? Yes. Lee? Yes. Mahoney? Yes. Mann? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Plantold? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. We'll move on to agenda item four, which is the 2021 administrative activities. And I'm Turning that back over to you, Duan. Yeah, I just have a quick um, update on IELTA revenue um, for agenda item uh, 4A. Um, so we have uh, calculated the remittances uh, through October. Um, November is not quite 
quite closed yet um, because we're still getting remittances from the bank. Um, and, and good news is that we had originally projected about $16 million through October and we've collected close to 17 million. So we're really on track um, and we're likely going to exceed the $21 million by the end of December that we had originally projected. So that, that, that's good given all the kind of economic uncertainties right now. And Kim, shall, shall I do the- review? Yeah, I was gonna say, yes, you just go on and review okay. the um, administrative calendar. Great. So in the meeting materials, um, there are two documents. The first one is the committee assignments, the updated committee assignments um, with the updated um, terms. Um, we had some errors in the last one. So if you could take a, a look at that to make sure that um, your assigned committee is correct um, and that your term is also correct. I've also included after that um, the meeting date for all the committees for, for the following year. Um, so we will work, Kim in our office, um, I, she's, I know she's already sent out calendar outlook invites for the commission meeting as well as the executive committee. Um, sometime in the next week or two, she will start sending out calendar invites for all the, the committee meetings. The only committee that does not have yet set uh, meeting dates is, is bank grants. So that will be coming to you um, soon. Okay, um, we are going, has the roster been circulated yet? I'm just- Oh yes, that, the roster has not been circulated, but I will email everyone um, the, the roster. And if you can confirm that your address is current and your contact information is current, um, then, then I'll recirculate an updated version. I think we have almost everything, um, but we just, sometimes people move and, and we're not aware of it. So you can take a look at that. I'll email that out either today or tomorrow. And, and it related to that, the, um, the website listing of the commissioners will be updated shortly to reflect the current uh, commission uh, membership. And then related to that, um, we put out a request uh, last meeting for anyone interested in being on the nominations committee. At the moment, we have a committee of one, which is Eric. So um, if anyone is interested in helping look into future commission membership, um, please get in touch with uh, Rich or, or me, and then we will um, we'll speak with Eric about moving that forward. And um, th that would be great, thank you. Um, liaison reports. Um, Jim, uh, I'm sorry, I had my own raised, but I, I took oh, it. Oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't, I didn't uh, see it. Yeah. On the nominations committee, uh, we had a discussion about the, the possibility of adding to its uh, responsibilities, uh, exit interviews with commissioners. So it would not simply be uh, vetting new potential members of the commission, but also working with those commissioners uh, who are leaving to uh, do an exit interview to have a better perspective on how we operate as an organization. Right. Yeah, thank you for that, Rich. Um, Kim, we Pamela, actually, has your hand up. We would actually like to start that um, if we if we could after after this meeting. Um, yeah, Pamela. I'd like to um, volunteer to assist with that. That would be great. Be great. That would be super, thank you. Okay, so now we have a committee of two. <laughs> we'll keep moving forward. Um, Anything else on administrative matters, Juan? No. Okay, we'll move on to liaison reports. Um, Bonnie and or Melanie on um, Judicial Council. I believe we are, um, hi, this is Melanie. Uh, I believe the contract are still uh, in process and um, should be coming along shortly. Uh, and outside of that, I don't know that we have any further updates. Bonnie, did you have anything else? Okay, I think she's um, been called off to another meeting. So I'm going to say that for the time uh, period right now, I, I think that's about uh, what we've got to report. So thank uh, you. Melanie, could you just, Elaborate a little bit when you referred to contracts, just so everybody knows. Oh, the uh, housing contracts and and the uh, the funding contracts that are going to come through for the EAP program. Um, those are still in process. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Selena, 
Legal Aid Association. Sure. Um, Juan, is this where you want me to do the presentation or is that yeah, later? Yeah, this, this is where. Um, oh, okay. Great, great. Um, so, Juan, do you want me to share my screen or do you want yeah, to share that, on your That would be great. Perfect. Right. Okay. So um, Dwan asked, um, years ago, we used to do a joint orientation with Bonnie from the State Bar, with me from Legal Aid Association, and with um, several State Bar staff for all new um, commissioners. And it's been a little while since we've done that. And so uh, Dwan asked if I would just put together a few slides um, with a little bit of lax history um, and how it intertwines with the commission. Um, Dwan says I have five minutes, and of course <laughs> I have 14 slides. Um, but I'm going to just share the slide with everyone. I, um, I've sent it to Dwan so she can send it to everyone else. Um, but I wanted just to give the context of how we were created at the same time as the commission and how we worked in partnership with the bar since our creation. Um, and let me quickly do um, start slideshow. I can start. Um, and with my apologies, you know how um, when you try to share on Zoom, you always do the wrong thing, but I'm going to share it the correct way. PowerPoint. Okay. And slideshow. Got it. And so you'll have access to all of this. I'm not going to read all of the content. It's just mostly for um, context. And I'm setting a timer for myself as I promised. Great. Um, so um, the Legal Aid Association of California was actually founded with IELTA, with IELTA statutes passage. So in the early 1980s, when federal funding for legal aid was under attack, the state bar actually convened legal services organizations as the state bar had, had just, you know, had just received the, the word that they would be administering the IELTA grants. And so they convened legal aid organizations and a resolution was passed to actually create LAC. So we were founded by legal aid organizations, but always in partnership with the state bar. And we were incorporated in 1983. Um, and if you recall, the IELTA statute passed in 1981, and I believe that grants started in 82 or 83. Um, and al although our creation was really, um, you know, married to that IELTA passage, our expansion has been really connected to the Equal Access Fund. So in 2001, which is right after the Equal Access Fund was created, the, um, all of the IELTA funded organizations actually voted to voluntarily increase their own dues so that LAC could expand. We were always a membership organization since we were created in partnership with the bar in 1983. But in 2001, our membership dues went up from, I think it was like $25 an organization to something that is much more significant now. Or some organizations pay over $10,000 in order to um, staff LAC's work. So in 2001, we, ex we expanded based on our membership dues. And in 2002, just after that, again, the state bar convened programs and realized that, that LAC needed to expand even more specifically to help the state bar with equal access fund administration. So the state bar at the time decided to, um, to fund a part of their equal access fund administra grant administration and coordination work um, by a, a contract with LAC. And so that was with community support and feedback. And I reference this later, but um, we are constantly talking about our partnership with the bar, how we, how we can convene programs, how we can get input, um, because we know that of the 100 IELTA funded programs, they, are, they do not always pay attention to Legal Services Trust Fund Commission meetings. Sometimes um, these meetings are, you know, they happen very quickly and programs say, well, what happened? Um, and so, so much of LAC's work was actually helping programs feel plugged in and feel like they could ask questions of state bar staff in order to know how that would impact their work. So just briefly on our advocacy work, we focus all of our advocacy on state work. So we don't do anything with the federal government. It's all state budget, state policy, state legislator education, um, state administrative agencies, amicus work, and judicial counsel. We do a lot of convenings and publications. And then, um, as I mentioned earlier, we are constantly assessing our coordination needs with the bar. I'm hearing background noise. Is that, is that bothering anybody? Okay. Okay. Um, so just really briefly, the Justice and Government Project. I think many of you are aware of this of the Federal Legal Aid Interagency Roundtable that Karen Lash ran when she was at the federal DOJ. When she left after the Obama administration, she started a project called the Justice and Government Project. And so um, we have we staff the Justice and Government Project. Sometimes we call it CLARE, the California Legal Aid Interagency Roundtable. Um, and these are just a few examples of what we do. We secure new state funding or federal funding that goes through state agencies. We work with the state agencies around grant um, program parameters and reporting. Um, and we also connect to existing funds. So if it's, not, if it's not a new source of funding, we look at an existing source of funding and we work with the agency about how their mission 
could be supported by folding in legal services as one of the delivery um, strategies. And um, we do a ton of meetings. These are all just listed here to show all the meetings that we do. Sometimes we co-convene them with law schools. Sometimes we co-convene them with the bar, with other legal aid organizations, with the judicial council. Um, and we have a number of publications. Zach Newman, who is also on as a member of the public, um, so he's muted now. He is our lead writer and researcher at LAC. So we do, um, you know, he does a research summary, which I find really helpful. If you want access to that, you can um, ask Zach. And we also have publications where we may hire an outside consultant. More publications. We sometimes partner with One Justice and other organizations like California Access to Justice Commission. Here we do a ton of webinars. We also do in-person conferences, they're all paused now, but um, we used to do in-person conferences largely in partnership with the State Bar and Judicial Council like Pathways to Justice and the Family Law Self-Help Conference. We have a fellowship. We fund fellowships over the summer for law students. And um, just this is my last 30 seconds. Law Help California is a statewide resource and referral website. It's actually listed on AB 3088, which is the eviction moratorium bill as a place where landlords need to list resources when they file a UD against um, a tenant. And so this is both resources and referrals. It is not just IELTA funded organizations. The referrals include court programs, lawyer referral services. We even include some um, sliding scale nonprofits. So it's not just the IELTA community, it's basically anywhere where someone could go to get legal help um, and also legal information. And that's it. So I'm always happy to answer questions about LAC and I'm sorry for the, the abbreviated thing, but I figure if people have questions, you can always ask me later. Thank you, Dwan, for, for letting me do a mini intro to LAC. That was great, Selena, thank you. Um, as long as I've been on the commission, I don't think um, we've ever had you. <laughs> actually do a little presentation. So that was terrific. Slides were great. Um, and you were like having to speak, you know, 100 miles an hour. So it'll be great for you to circulate. We'll circulate those. Um, and, you know, you guys do terrific work. And you're often our ears and our eyes, you know, when we, we need to know what's going on in, in the community in terms of the program. So um, thank you. We obviously look forward to working together and being able to rely on you and having a partnership. So that was terrific. Thank you so much. Um, we could probably take a question or two for Selena now, if anybody had one. Eric, Eric. Eric, yeah. Hi, Selena, great, great um, presentation. <clears throat> Just apropos of something that came up at the homelessness uh, committee last time, I noted that um, a lot of organizations seem to be generating things like Know Your Rights publications uh, for various things. And it seemed to me like there's, we're just maybe funding the same thing, you know, 50 different times across the state. So you're, when, you, when you talked about all the publications that LAC um, creates, I'm wondering if there's any way on a statewide basis that we can figure out um, to maybe more efficiently share know your rights kinds of publications in various areas. We've actually talked about this a lot. I think Bonnie identified this a few years ago with maybe HP round one funding, perhaps it was, it was, it was a little while back um, where she noticed that a lot of organizations were doing know your rights materials. And we convened a meeting of directors of litigation and advocacy. And we all talked about the materials that people were creating with their new HP funds. And it was really interesting because a lot of organizations really want to create their own based on their client communities. And so they can translate into other languages. But the conversation was great because organizations said, well, if you're doing outreach to people who are unhoused and you encounter transition aged youth or you encounter children, like please also give my materials. So they did talk a little bit about sharing materials with each other. But I think it's been really hard to get people to agree to use the same know your rights materials. But at least we do have our director of litigation and advocacy listserv where people share. Um, and we also, we post their know your rights materials on our website on the Law Help California website. And so we do a little bit of vetting to figure out the best ones. And I think in, in California also the challenge is that there may be um, county protections or city protections. And so even if you have like a great flyer that could be statewide, organizations would want to change it to say, well, you know, in our county, there's this additional protection or there's additional, this agency. Um, Allison Korn, who runs our Law Health California project, has also been working on county-based resources for people who are in, um, you know, have been financially impacted by job loss because of COVID. 
like wh where, where's to get, um, you know, where to get food banks material, like basically like a two one one, but with a legal lens using information from Law Help California. Mm -hmm. But there's, there's not a good answer. I, I wish that we could have a good statewide know your rights for a number of different areas, but organizations um, want to put their own spin on it. So we just try to share so they can build off each other instead of starting from scratch. Uh, Will. I was just wondering if there was any way to continue that conversation because I really strongly agree with Eric that having to seek legal services, the most challenging part for me has always been finding out what are my rights and who who can I contact? And I I I feel like that's a crazy burden. So is there any motion or action that I can propose here to continue what what Eric has su suggested would be useful? I, I think possibly a discussion with Selena um, afterwards might would be helpful. I know there's been for years there was there have been discussions about having a statewide um, bank for every library bank for everybody to draw on and, and then programs can tweak for their localities. Um, so I think it's an important discussion and getting your ideas to Selena, I think would, would be a good way to um, kind of start to move the discussion from, from uh, with, with, your, with your ideas. I certainly know that when we have looked in the past at um, bank grant applications for funding and other funding sources, we have looked at whether or not there was a proposal to develop materials and whether that seemed necessary. So in, in, in practice, I think that the commission has paid attention and not wanted to um, fund a duplication of resources that were, were not necessary, um, but it's become so much more complicated um, with uh, the various rent stabilization and controls and then COVID on top of that. So um, thank you. Bonnie. I will follow up with uh, Selena for sure, because it, it is useful even online, especially. I understand that the need for paper in person, you really want to customize it, but online, it would be great if there was a, a clearing house there. So uh, thank you both. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Will. Bonnie. Sorry, got my hand down, but not the unmute. Um, yeah, well, this is obviously a huge issue that we're always interested in. And just a couple things. One is um, the California courts have a self-help website. And one of the things that has, it's updated with um, materials and resources. And one of the things that we've also really tried to do is interact really closely with Law Help California because you can put in your um, county and your legal issue and it will identify the programs that are available for you, which is, I think it's a great resource and really challenging. It's, you know, we're, we're a state with 39 million people and some of those like, what's the right thing for you, I think is just a lot more challenging in, in some, of, um, some of that work. But um, Melanie and Juan and um, Selena and I have already been, you know, talking about doing a new convening with um, looking at these new grants, figuring out ways to help coordinate um, even more effectively. So thank you. Okay. Um, important ideas to move, move forward. Um, we're going to move on to um, agenda item six. And um, reverse the order of A and B because um, Erica Carroll's not quite here. Well, actually, Erica Connolly and Erica Carroll are now here. Hi, sorry. Oh, they're both here. Okay, all right. I so apologize. we're going to re-reverse re now that they're here. And we will start with um, uh, oh, item please. A under uh, IOLTA and Equal Access. So we turn it over to the Ericas. Great. Um, so, and I assume Erica Carroll's also here, hopefully. She is here. Um, er er there she is. Okay. Hi. Yes. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, so I, I will kind of take a, take the sort of first crack at this. Um, 
So as we sort of talked about at our last commission meeting, there were a few carryover requests that were quite sizable. Um, and so our committee wanted to take some extra time and um, we put a working group together and get some additional information from the um, organizations <clears throat> regarding, especially in particular, like what, um, what their plans were for spending down the carryovers that were somewhat large and um, you know what percentage of the budget where they were going to spend it that kind of stuff and so um, I first like to just extend my appreciation to Bonoche and to Jim for being on the working group um, and and you know putting in the time and effort on that and I'd also like to thank um, Erica Carroll, um, as always, because she does such a great job communicating with the organizations and getting us the information that we requested. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank her and Juan for making time to kind of sit um, and, and meet with us and kind of go over everything. So we ultimately at the committee have, um, we are recommending that the commission approve the outstanding um, uh, request for carryover, but we'll say, and this is something we covered in our meeting last week, um, that ultimately we, we do so somewhat hesitantly, and there was a, some messaging that we wanted to communicate, and we discussed this in more detail in our committee meeting on Friday. I'm going to kind of give a high-level messaging to the commission just to let you know what we were thinking, and also if there's any reactions or if you think that any of our views on this um, need to be discussed further, but essentially, you know, we wanted to emphasize to organizations our role is one of oversight um, over the funds that we provide. And um, as part of that oversight role, we ultimately want the organizations to, you know, understand that we, we, we request a lot of information from them. We do that in order to serve in that oversight um, position. And while we, um, think staff does a great job helping them. Ultimately, it's the organization's responsibilities to get the information to us. And so we wanna make sure that that's, there's been some messaging in our committee that there's some concerns about whether staff has been doing enough. And ultimately, you know, staff has a hundred organizations. They have to go through all this information. They have to review it. They have to get it to us. We just like to make sure the organizations understand um, you know, that, that ultimately they, they really need to take responsibility on that. Um, along those lines, we're planning to update Smart Simple on the carryover requests to ask about not just why the money wasn't spent down in the past, but also what the plans are to spend down money in the future. So we thought that was very useful information that's not part of the application right now and or the, the forms. And so the, the plan is to change that. Um, we also wanted to point out that we have been flexible with the organizations in 2020 and 2021 um, due to the extraordinary circumstances that have been going on. But we did want to emphasize that um, the policies in our, you know, that that we, our view of the funds is that, um, and our understanding under our obligations under the statute is that organizations should not be creating reserves with the funds that we give them. They need to be spending and getting that out to the community. We understand that. Um, there are business decisions that organizations make, and we don't fault them for, you know, within the rules trying to operate, but we'd like to emphasize that we want them to get that money out. It helps us with advocating to get more money in if we know that they're actually spending the money down. Um, and while we have been flexible in the past couple of years, right now at least, we're not seeing the same extraordinary circumstances occurring next year. And so on the one hand, the money needs that we are recommending for approval would need to be spent down in six months instead of a year, which is um, the additional time we gave them in 2020. And also we expressed that we will be fairly um, reluctant to approve and fairly skeptical of requests to approve carryovers over 50% at the end of 2022. Not saying that we won't, but we really, um, you know, we think that that's a pretty sizable request. And so we, in the past have, prior to the recent shift in the policies have been, you know, looked very carefully at those kind of, we look carefully at everything. I'm not saying we don't do our oversight role, but, you know, we are, we are hesitant to approve really big carryover requests because we want the money to go out. 
Um, having said all of that, we, uh, as I said, we recommend that the commission approve the remaining um, carryover requests. We do think that we have now given notice to the organization, something that we hadn't um, sort of given them that heads up in the past. We would sort of said we'd give a flexible approach. And um, now we think that hopefully the organizations have the information they need to be able to prepare with their budgets and their spending for the 2022 year. So with that, um, I think Eric and Carol probably has our uh, recommended motion that she'll put up. And if you guys have any questions or would like to discuss any of our messaging further, um, happy to answer them. And also if there's other members of my committee on here, obviously who can also speak to that. Um, so as you can see, this is the um, motion that we are recommending. Um, I'll just read it very quickly. So resolved, given extraordinary circumstances in 2020, 2021, the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission has exercised its discretion to permit a flexible approach to carryover requests. In light of that exercise of discretion, the commission approves the remaining budget revision and carryover requests above 25% of the 2021 IOLTA EAF grant awards. The commission does not anticipate such extraordinary circumstances going forward, and therefore will no longer apply that flexible approach when considering future requests. So we wanted to make sure that our um, organizations understand and have notice as they get their money going forward. Okay, that's my spiel. <laughs> Apologies again for being late. For some reason, I thought we were starting at 10 and then I saw uh, Kim's email and I was like, oh gosh. So I apologize. Thank you for your patience. Okay, thank you. Is there discussion um, questions regarding the motion that's before us? And um, uh, er Erica, Carol, do, do you want to add anything to what's been presented thus far? Um, I don't think so. I, just, I did want to mention that, you know, the focus was primarily on carryovers, but there was one budget revision that's included in the meeting material. So um, that was less of a concern, but that is incorporated in the motion. So. Okay. Thank you. Move to approve. Oh. Second. Great. I'll do roll call. Rhinus? Yes. Savage? Yes. Shriver? Yes. Vanarelli, Aglagi, Asaraf, Ball. Jeff, are you still there? Everybody's muted. Mm -hmm. he's, in, he's muted? Yes. Okay, so. Fightmaster, Bennett? Yes. Blakemore? Yes, but abstain us to Disability Rights California. Thank you, Catherine. Bashelli? Yes. Connolly? Yes. Friedman? Galkin? Yes. Fiskin? Yes. Cruz? Yes. Jo uh, Joseph Lee? Yes. Mahoney? Yes. Mann? Yes, abstain us to Disability Rights California. Thank you. Meeker? Yes. Plantold? Yes, yes. Motion passes. This is Joe Lee. I should also um, abstain us to Disability Rights California. Thank you. Hey, okay, thank you. We'll move on to uh, item B under um, agenda item six uh, regarding the dismissal of a client complaint against Lisnick. Um, and I believe, Rich, you're going to do a brief uh, update on this, and then we'll have a motion. Oh, I'm sorry, Kim. There's there's one more. Um, motion, Erica, is that right? Oh, right. All right. Um, what you just voted on was 2021, but there are actually um, two 2020 budget revisions that were um, up for consideration that the, the committee addressed last week. So um, as Erica mentioned before, the 
commission was very flexible with carryovers from 2020 into 2021, meaning organizations have this entire year to spend down their carryover amounts, which is why we received um, a few requests for actual budget revisions on, on the 2020 grant. Reports. So um, in the meeting materials that we provided, there were two organizations that were above 25% of their grant award um, for the budget revisions on IOLTA, and that was Asian Americans Advancing Justice LA and Los Angeles Center for Law and Justice. Um, at the committee meeting, they uh, you know, discussed the fact that these organizations were moving funds into things like personnel and program expenses, which we generally encourage. Um, and the committee, after discussion, uh, recommended approval of those budget revisions as well. So. Um, we do have a, a separate motion for the 2020 budget revisions also, which I can put up. All moved. Erica, uh, either either of you, just a question: uh, Were either of these uh, agencies recipients of PPP loans? Yes, I believe both of them were, and at least one of them cited that as part of the reason for needing the budget revision. So. Other comments or questions for either of the Ericas? Bob moved. Do we have a second? Catherine will second. Thank you, Catherine. Roll call. Rhinus? Yes. Savage? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Vanarelli, Aglagi, Al Saraf, Ball? Yes. Jeff Ball? Okay, great. Yes. Fightmaster? Bennett? Yes. Blakemore? Yes. Bushelli? Yes. Connolly? Yes. Friedman, Galkin? Yes. Iskin? Yes. Cruz? Yes. Lee? Yes. Mahoney? Yes. Mann? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Plantold? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Now we'll move on to um, Item B, which is um, dismissal of the client complaint against Lisnick and um, Rich. Thanks, Kim. Uh, at our last meeting, we had a discussion about a client complaint that was filed against Lisnick, uh, Legal Services of Northern California, uh, and uh, the work that had been done by staff in respect of that. Uh, we uh, have as a commission the jurisdiction to to investigate claims that are made uh, in many, many years on this commission. This is the first I've seen. Generally, they don't reach the commission unless 90 days have passed without resolution uh, for reasons that were detailed at the last This claim went beyond that deadline. Uh, it was uh, therefore brought to the commission. Uh, we had robust discussion about the, the claim. Justice Murray led the charge in uh, asking that we wait uh, the 30 day period for the claimant to respond to the uh, proposed or tentative finding of the commission that the complaint be dismissed. Just to remind you, the purview of our jurisdiction is to, to determine whether or not the claim raises valid issues with respect to whether or not the grantee, in this case, Lesnick, has violated the enabling statutes or rules and regulations of the commission in the state bar. That determine was made, the de determination was made and the um, staff recommended dismissal of the complaint at our last meeting, uh, but Justice Murray persuaded us all that uh, it would be wise to give the claimant an opportunity to respond. 30 days have passed since uh, the claimant received the determination that no rules or regulations or policies had been violated and that the claim would be dismissed. Uh, and we have heard nothing from the claimant. Uh, his silence uh, then uh, will have to be attributed to his not having any further comment on this. 
And I would uh, ask the commission now to formally approve dismissal of the claim and open the, the floor up for comment. And we can put the vote, can we get the motion up on the screen yeah, let me, also? Let me share in the, the motion. motion. Um, can you all see this? Yes. And I just want to make one mo um, note about the motion. Um, it's tweaked a little bit at the request of Kim and Rich um, that as meritless there was is what was added to be responsive um, to Lisnick's um, letter that was received. So I'll, I'll read the motion. Resolved that the Legal Service Trust Fund Commission, after review of the staff report, finds that the Legal Services of Northern California Lisnick has met the requirements of trust fund program rules and policies and dismissed the complaint received in March 2021 as meritless. Thank you, Duan. Any um, comments? Again, so moved. Do I have a second? Yeah. Justice, Justice Murray here. Thank you. Just, just real quick. I, sure. I wonder if we might want to reference Lisnick's response in the resolution. Uh, can you? Can I? Oh, let me let me share let me share it again then. Sorry, because when I yeah. do, I can't see the. Give me a second. Here's a motion. Yeah. So after review of, excuse me, let me move this here. After review of the staff report and the letter from Lisnick or something like that. And Lisnick's, oh, Dan, um, Elizabeth, do you have the, the date of that letter by any chance I can cite it? I'm looking it up now. Okay. I mean, the, the letter was incorporated in the staff report, but somebody just looking oh. at the resolution wouldn't necessarily know that. The letter was dated November 15th. And it was addressed to the commission, Elizabeth? Is that uh, yes, it was, well, it was exist, exec, um, sorry, addressed to the executive committee of the commission, specifically. Should probably put the year in there also. In November right, 15, I was going to suggest that. 2021. So, resolved that the Legal Service Trust Fund Commission, after review of the staff report and Liz Nick's November 15th, um, 2021, letter to the Executive Committee of the Commission finds that, hold on, let me switch this. finds that Lisnick has met the requirements of trust fund program rules and policies and dismisses the complaint received in March, 2021 as meritless. Does that, does that sound okay? I, I think yes. that's a, I think that's a, a really, um, really important addition. And we have some hands raised. I don't know the order, Kim. Um, well, I don't know order either because I was, I think, I think it was uh, Zahira. Um, okay. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, I also need to step off in a minute. So um, thank you for, for letting me speak. Uh, you know, my, my one concern is that, you know, I think for this Liz Nick letter, this is the letter where it said that the trust fund um, has no authority to determine whether the denial of limitation of a grantee services to an applicant or client is appropriate. And I thought that was kind of the crux of some of the, what we were discussing at our last commission meeting and making it clear that we did have the authority, whether or not the, complaint had merit was part of the, the conversation and the discussion or um, the timing and all of those other pieces that, that, we, that we covered. It's actually the timing that was a lot of what we were talking about. And so I just wonder, um, my concern would be uh, having a, a reference that could potentially suggest that that's, that that's you know, a, a valid um, statement that we don't have the authority um, to, to do this level of review and discussion um, in terms of referencing the letter. I, I don't know if there's a way to, to couch this, this more um, to, 
add in that particular piece, but that would be my concern with the, the letter addition. Thank you. So are you, you're suggesting that we, I mean, the letter is public record, anyone could get it, but are you suggesting that we, we just not reference this in the motion? Um, do. You know, I, oh, sorry, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, under other circumstances, if they didn't have some of those references in there, I think it would make a lot of sense to reference the letter. I think under these circumstances, since they're questioning our authority within the letter, um, that I would suggest that we not uh, reference the letter um, and just have a reference to the staff report, which incorporates the letter, um, but doesn't this, uh, this then when can specifically call out the letter as having particular um, weight in terms of the decision, it really is the full piece in terms of the staff report, the letter, the other materials, et cetera. Um, uh, Eric, and then Pamela. Uh, yeah, Zahir's concern is exactly what I was going to say. Um, I, I do have that concern. And, you know, one, maybe one way around it, we could either delete the reference as uh, Zahira just sort of suggested, or we could keep the reference. But I actually like the idea that we were kicking around last time of getting back to Lisnick with a brief letter that just simply professionally takes, not in an adversary way, but just mm -hmm. respectfully takes issue with with their assertion that that the uh, Legal Services Trust Fund Commission lacks authority to review this issue and to tell them we do have this authority. And we've reviewed it and they've done a great job and there are no <laughs> violations. But I think we, we should do either of those two things. Pamela, thank you, Eric. Pamela. Hi, I just wanted to add, do we need to include that claimant re, uh, failed to respond in the timely manner? Um, it, I think the staff report um, it, it indicates um, that as part of the factual summary. So I don't think in the motion it's necessary, although others certainly might um, disagree. Um, uh, Joseph? Thank you. I, I had to unmute. I, I first wanted to second the point of I do think we should get back to the L, I guess it's Lisnick, LSNC, yes. on the jurisdiction point. On the language that's before us right now, I guess I come out differently as to the point of adding the highlighted words. I would prefer not to see them because I think it's implicit in our conclusion that Lisnick has met the requirements that the complaint lacked merit. So I don't think we need to say it. And it actually goes a little further than I need to say, that, that I think we need to say. I, I don't know that any of us knows that there isn't any merit whatsoever, not even a, you know, an iota of truth to the allegations that they were making. I think we've concluded based on the available facts that Liz Nick met the requirements of the trust fund program rules and policies with respect to the to the subject matter of the complaint. It doesn't mean they were perfect or that the allegations against them were completely and utterly without merit. So I would prefer to make two changes. Uh, I, I would add where it says Lisnick has met the requirements of trust fund program rules and policies, I would say with respect to the subject or the, the, the matter at issue or the, the subject of the letter. And I would vote not to include the as merit list. I think it's, I think it goes further than than we need to, and that I think may be appropriate. Well, let me add what you just suggested first, and then everybody can can see that. I'll highlight that. Uh, was it with respect? With, with respect to the letter or the matters raised in the letter? Well, it would be the complaint. Complaint, right? Yeah, yeah, the complaint. Right, right. I'll highlight it, and then I'll let. Um, right. I'll decide whether to keep okay. it. Okay, um, Justice Murray. Yeah, I see uh, Zahara's uh, concern, and uh, but I, I think I have a way to address that. I because I do think it's important that we send a message to Lisnick that we did review their letter. 
without endorsing certain allegations in there. Uh, so after the uh, word commission, comma. Right here, Justice Murray? Correct. Okay. Some, something like exercising its authority under whatever the pertinent rule is, comma. And I don't recall the, I, I read the report, but I don't recall the rule number off the top of my head, but whatever the rule numbers are, cite those there and then comma. Is this, is this right? Elizabeth State Bar Rule or Dan State Bar Rule? That's for my memory, but I'm not positive. That's Sorry, it's uh, 3.692, I believe. Let me, I'll confirm that right now. Yeah, so that way it, it's clear that, uh, or at least it's implied that we disagree with the notion that we have no, no authority in this area, that we're citing the applicable rule that lends that authority to the commission for purposes of making this determination. I, I also kind of like the idea of, uh, of deleting the, the last phrase as meritless. I, I do think, <clears throat> it, it is unnecessary. Uh, according to the rule, we have the authority to address or dismiss these complaints and we don't really have to give a, a, a reason in the context of this resolution. Um, so I, I don't know what the, all the thinking was like to hear it, I think, about adding that phrase, but um, it, it does seem to be unnecessary to our resolution of this matter. Kim, Rich, do you want to respond to that quickly and the as meritless? Because that was your, I think, I believe that was your suggestion. Kim, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, the concern there was that Lisnick uh, has, uh, had the, the letter of November 15th indicated a tremendous concern on the part of Lisnick that it had been unjustly uh, accused by this claimant of conduct uh, on the intake process in particular, uh, of which it, uh, it was not guilty. And I think, uh, I, 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 re I don't recall where this phrase came from, but it was in response to what was perceived to be uh, a palliative to Lisnick to say that we have made a determination uh, that their conduct was appropriate. But I, to, on reflection, I agree with Justice Murray uh, and with Joe Lee that uh, it would probably uh, not, it doesn't really add much. You know, if, if the rule said that there were certain findings we could make like meritless or unsubstantiated or, you know, something like that, then it would make sense, I think, to add that if it was in the rule, but it's not in the rule. And I at least from what I recall reading it as I glanced at it, so, yeah. Is everyone comfortable with removing it, Kim? Are you comfortable? Um, yeah, it's, yes. Um, I thought I saw uh, Judge Jaskell's hand go up. Um, I'm That's not okay, able... I'll withdraw my comment. Okay, all right. Um, oh gosh, uh, Bob and then Will. I didn't see whose hand went up first, so. Thank you. Um, we're talking pretty much within the legal community. If you take out the meritless, how is this going to play for the understanding of the aggrieved complainant? Now, maybe it lacks merit, but how do you know the complainant will, will understand that that is meritless as opposed to one set of attorneys is working for another set of attorneys and could the complainant still feel there's some grounds? I'm trying to point out that, does this read the same to a member of the public, maybe a family member of the complainant or roommate? Does this read the same as to you folks or to Lisnick if you take out as meritless? That's why I think it's worth some wording form to keep it in. Well. Uh, thank you. There are certainly a number of issues on the table. So I, um, my, my biggest question was first for, oh geez, um, 
Rich, I believe we were going to do an informal outreach to LSNC and get their feedback. Was that able to happen? And what was the outcome? I don't, I don't know that we need to send them a message if we've already sent them a message. Thank you. Rich, do you want me to provide that update? Yes, please. Okay. Um, so Elizabeth did reach out to, to Gary Smith, who's the executive director, right after the meeting to update him on the motion um, and procedurally what was going to happen next. And he was very appreciative of it. Um, we did try to then um, set up a meeting between um, him and uh, Kim Savage, um, but he has been on vacation. So that meeting will take place um, after this commission meeting because we're running into the holidays. I don't know if you recall. Yeah. Thank you. Christian. Uh, you know, I guess I just, I'm, I would resist the meritless designation just to respond to Bob a little bit because I'm not sure that, um, that it, it's really necessary and it feels a little gratuitous to me, especially because it's not like there was a, you know, an in-person hearing and a, a reasoned order um, and you know there was it was it was reviewed thoroughly but um, I don't know that word has a lot of um, has a lot of legal import which gives me some pause and and I don't think we want as a commission to be finding um, something to be meritless with the potential of sort of uh, discouraging future uh, concerns being raised. So uh, I'd, I'd be more comfortable with it all. Okay, I, um, Justice Murray, and then I think we probably will um, move to a motion if there are no more comments, all of which are uh, appreciated. Thank you, Justice Murray. You're on mute, Thank you, sorry. One last thought on deleting that as meritless phrase. I don't know that you, uh, you wanna set up any kind of precedence for the future where somebody else is asking for the same kind of finding in a situation where it might be, you know, closer call in the sense that a complaint is unsubstantiated, but still might have merit. Some legal service provider in the future might say, well, can't you say it's meritless? And uh, I, again, I don't, I don't think you wanna set the commission up for establishing that kind of precedence for, for the future. Unless of course, you know, there's a rule change that says, you know, the commission makes certain kinds of findings, for example, uh, police uh, internal affairs under the penal code, they, they have a sort of gradation of findings like unsubstantiated or uh, I forget what the others are right now. But the point is, I don't think we have to say it. I, I, I understand Bob's concern about uh, the public and how the public reads this. Of course, we always have those kinds of issues from my line of business explaining appellate decisions in a way that you know all the litigants understand but the reality of it is this is a legal document and I'm not sure that uh, that a, a, a understanding of everybody in the public of what we're saying is required in this context. Thank you. Um I think we are ready to move forward. Um, Kim, I'll, I'll move that we uh, approve the amended resolution as it presently reads on screen. Thank you. Do I hear a second? Second. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can do what roll call. So I'm sorry. So Rich moved and who seconded? I, I missed that. Uh, Eric, I believe. Eric, okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Rhinus? Yes. Savage? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Vanarelli, Aglagi, Al Saraf, Ball? Yes. Fightmaster Bennett? Yes. 
Blakemore? Yes. Boschelli? Yes. Connolly? Yes. Friedman? Galkin? Yes. Iskin? Yes. Cruz? Yes. Lee? Yes. Mahoney? Yes. Mann? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Plantold? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the discussion. I think there was a lot of thought that went into people's comments and consideration of how to resolve this and uh, with a lot of integrity. And I think it reflects very well on the commission. I thank you everybody for your comments. Um, we're now moving on to um, agenda item seven, which is homelessness prevention grants. And um, Chris and Jim, I'll let you take over. Yeah, I think Chris has a presentation. Kim, thank you, Jim. Um, we'll just dive right into it. I'm co-presenting with Danielle, and I'll just introduce the first couple slides here. So the, um, the Homelessness Prevention Funds Committee has two items on the agenda for this meeting. The first one is to discuss and approve the what we call the HP3, the third iteration of homelessness prevention or HP grants, um, specifically the HP3 competitive grants, because there are also formula grants. Um, and then the, um, the other item on the agenda for today was to discuss uh, HP2, homelessness prevention two, uh, budget um, revision requests. Um, that item, uh, I'm just going to flag up front. The HP funds committee. I was in a, we were unable, and staff was unable to get ready for the committee's December second meeting. So we're carrying that over into January. We're going to ask the committee to meet in January to look at those. Um, HP two is in the first year of its three year grant period, so it's not urgent at least not like um, a one-year grant like IOLTA or EAF. Um, so there is time still to look at those. So we're gonna focus our presentation on that first agenda item, the um, approval of the Homelessness Prevention Competitive Grants. Okay, uh, let me share my screen. All right, so the... Um, uh, Danielle is going to present some background about the awards. Um, we'll discuss the um, review process for these grants and scores that the committee and the scoring team um, ended up adopting, the committee's recommendations for HP3 competitive funding, um, what we see as the public policy outcomes of the recommendation, and we'll have a resolution for you. Um, just before I turn it over to Danielle, um, as a, since a couple of the commissioners um, I don't think were here in August, um, and as a reminder for everyone else, procedurally how we got to this point is the full commission passed a resolution on August 13th, um, delegating certain authorities to the committee and to staff to um, uh, recommend these awards uh, so that they could go out the door by January 1st. And so the, the resolution was that the commission delegated authority to the committee to, to approve the request for proposals, which includes the scoring rubric, for 2022 homelessness prevention competitive grants. And it um, delegated authority to staff to score the applications, quote, in consultation with the committee. So that was sort of the procedural step that got us here. And I'll turn it over to Danielle. And I can tab through the slides for you, Danielle, if you just let me know. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, so as Chris mentioned, we wanted to first provide a little bit of background um, on the, the grants more broadly. And so Assembly Bill 164 amends the Budget Act of 2021 and allocates 40 million to the Judicial Council to distribute through the commission for these homelessness prevention grants. An additional 40 million will become available in the next two years, which facilitates a three year um, amount of 80 million in homelessness prevention funding. And again, as Chris mentioned, we're calling this the Homelessness Prevention 3 or HP3 grants. Um, both QLSPs and support centers can receive these funds to provide homelessness prevention services, and we'll go through the permissible activities in a moment. Um, and then after administrative costs, 75% of that full 80 million um, was to go to formula grants, which are uh, funded through or calculated through a modified IOLTA formula. And then the remaining 25% are competitive grants, which is what we are speaking about today. So Chris, you can go to the next slide, perfect. Uh, and the permissible uses of the funds 
in uh, AB 164 include eviction defense and other tenant defense assistance and landlord tenant rental disputes, as well as services to prevent foreclosure for homeowners, which was new um, and not in some other HP funds uh, in the past. Also services to improve habitability, increase affordable housing, ensure receipt of eligible income or benefits to improve financial and therefore housing stability, legal help for persons displaced because of domestic violence, which was also new in the language this year, and then more broadly, um, just a homelessness prevention kind of catch all um, clause as well. And then the other parameters and requirements for these funds, um, particularly for the competitive awards that we're speaking about today, Again, it must go to a qualified legal, legal services project or support center. However, the legislature has encouraged programs to partner with and subgrant to IOLTA and non-IOLTA providers, including community-based organizations or government organizations. Uh, with these funds, the organizations must perform the permissible activities that we just spoke about, and they also must avoid supplanting existing funds. And then finally, these projects, uh, ser projects serving rural and underserved communities must receive preference um, was language in the legislation. Can I jump in here, Danielle? Of course. So the, um, Danielle mentioned earlier that 75% of this 85 or $80 million after taking on um, the admin fees or admin costs, 75% is going via formula. And that um, I think it's fair to characterize overwhelmingly favors urban areas. And so it's unsurprising that year after year, the legislature has stuck in the 25% competitive track, a preference for rural to make sure that these dollars, because the, the funding formula sort of um, prioritizes where very, very low income Californians reside, which tends to be like more urban areas, just higher concentrations there. Um, and so they wanted to make sure that these dollars can also reach the rural areas. And so I think that that's one of the reasons they stick this in there. Great. And so, uh, again, as Chris mentioned, there was a scoring rubric by which we or with which we used to score the applications that was adopted on August 31st. And then the RFP request for proposal document um, that went with that rubric provided guidance for each of the criterion and staff proposed definitions for each criterion of not addressed below expectations, meets expectations, and exceeds expectations. Um, and we wanted to say on the, at the outset that the rubric was a tool to guide staff and the committee evaluations, but staff and the committee may exercise discretion to make awards uh, that accomplish the goals of the legislation. So again, um, giving preference to rural areas of the state, also um, getting a diversity of geographic reach of projects and also uh, diversity of interventions in those projects. And so that, that you know, contemplates a post-scoring analysis. So we scored applications using the rubric, but then um, had some flexibility for discussion uh, beyond simply the numerical score that each program earned. And the scores are based on the rubric you see here. So again, we used categories of exceeds, meets below expectations or not addressed, but then the, the different categories or rows of the rubric um, contemplated project impact and strategies, organizational capacity, focus on rural populations and focus on underserved populations. So those were incorporated into the rubric itself, project evaluation, and then also special consideration, which was a score of zero to 10 points, um, which particularly focused on whether projects um, had those partnerships that the legislature was hoping projects would incorporate. And then also um, a preference for ev evidence-based advocacy strategies because these funds are federal dollars and the federal government um, has a preference for uh, evidence-based strategies. And so we wanted to, or the commission and committee wanted to incorporate that into the rubric as well. And I will turn it over to Chris, unless there are any other questions. Danielle. Um, so just have a few more slides for you, just going to talk about how the scoring unfolded and how the committee arrived at its recommendations for today. 
And then um, Danny and I will preview for you just a sample of the recommended proposals. I think we have three or four that we can just describe in a few sentences to give you a flavor. The, um, as you know, the profile sheets for all of them were part of the meeting materials. Um, and then we're gonna leave a little time for the committee members to um, share their thoughts about today's recommendations um, and then we'll have the resolution. So for the review process, there were 34 applications um, all together for competitive funding. Uh, just as a, um, as a reminder, we provided this update, I think at the last commission meeting, but there were 75 applications for the formula funding. So that formula funding, that 75% of the total is going all across the state. So for the competitive applications, which was a much more rigorous application to complete, um, there were 34 applications altogether. They saw 33, about $33,800,000 combined, 29 qualified legal services projects or what are basically direct legal services providers applied and five statewide support centers. Um, all 34 expressed and described uh, in, in responses to the application questions, a focus on underserved communities. So again, that was in the statute is something that could uh, or should confer preference. 26 described in the application a focus on rural communities. And there were application questions that asked specifically about those. Given the short timeline for review, the commission again delegated authority to staff to score in consultation with the committee. So the committee um, identified at least three moments where it would provide robust consultation. So one was before scoring. Um, it held a calibration meeting, where, a meeting where it calibrated, it interpreted the scoring rubric after programs had applied. And it did that by applying the rubric in a public meeting with the scoring team observing. Um, to uh, apply the rubric to a cross section of five proposals. So that meeting was on October 29th. Um, it then held another meeting, um, and this was at the request of the scoring team on November 22nd to further apply the rubric to some proposal, to three proposals uh, where the scoring team had questions about rubric interpretation. The next moment, of consultation was during scoring. Uh, the committee had its chair, uh, Jim Meeker, participate in all scoring sessions and meetings where the scoring team um, came up with its own recommendations for funding figures, um, even though the committee later um, adjusted those figures to, to best give best effect to AB 164. And then the next moment was after the scoring, um, it met, the committee met on December 2nd, it evaluated all 20, as you'll see, there are gonna be 23 recommended proposals, evaluated all 23 of them, um, and, and discuss the award figures that the committee would recommend to the commission today. Um, so for the scores, um, these are in the meeting materials, but the scoring team, the staff and committee chair scoring team arrived at a consensus score for every, every single proposal, not just the 23 projects that's rec it recommended, the committee ended up recommending, but every single one, and not just the total score, but for every single row of the rubric, the scoring team arrived at a consensus, like is this a below a meter and exceeds for this category, all the way down to a consensus score for the special consideration row of the rubric, which was a range of zero to 10 points. Um, so there's there's there was, you know, a great um, sort of like consensus at the scoring team level. The highest score was an 88. The lowest score was a 54. The most score, the most points possible was 100. Average was 71 and the most frequent was 75. Um, the scoring team recommended to the committee on December 2nd uh, that it adopt the top 23 scoring applications, which had a spread of 68 to 88 points. And they're the ones you see in the table. Um, and the committee ended up agreeing with that recommendation, um, but adjusted the funding figures. So I'm gonna um, talk about how the committee came up with the funding figures. So there was 19 million, there is 19 million five hundred thousand dollars available. Um, that's after deducting anticipated admin costs. Um, 19 million five hundred thousand dollars available for competitive awards, splitting that among um, 23 applicants. So the total score didn't determine, uh, the total score determined each proposal sort of place in line for funding. So the higher you score, the more likely you were to get some funding rather than the exact amount. Um, and the reason that the scoring team suggested that approach and the committee ended up sort of adopting that approach in the course of its meeting on December 2nd is that some budgets were leaner or more conservative than others. It's ra it was rather clear after looking at them that some programs were more comfortable putting in a lot more space in their budget than, than did other programs. And that a pure score driven analysis of the budget, like, uh, you know, like the top scoring would get almost their entire ask. And then you'd, you'd have like tiers of like, what percentage of their ask they'd get, that that would result in a situation where 
applicants that were particularly conservative in their budgeting and tried not to ask for anything they really didn't need might actually not get enough of an award if they had a medium score or a low score, but we're still going to get funding. Um, so to adjust for that, the scoring team and the committee ended up looking mostly, so it's not an exhaustive list, but for the most part, at the proportionality of the project deliverables to the funding request, sort of like how many clients the program would serve, um, you know, how far apart ever all the clients would be, the degree of fiscal conservatism in the budget, given the budget narratives, um, the, um, the likely capacity of the grant, the potential grantee to still have an impactful project if it didn't get its full request, even if it had to scale down the deliverables accordingly. Um, the sufficiency of the budget narratives and other explanations, how detailed they were, and also the comparative size of the applicant's HP3 formula award, which will run at the same time as the HP3 competitive award, um, if they applied for one. And it is worth noting that they can't actually use their HP3 formula funds for their HP3 competitive project because the statute prohibits um, that supplantation. But the committee, this, the committee knows, and then and um, the commission knows that it was the legislature's intention by having 75%, the lion's share of the formula funds go up by formula, that that was going to go to certain parts of California more than others. It's, it's you know where very very low income Californians live, and so that if there was a lot of formula funding going to particular parts of the state the committee might want to, and the commission might want to make sure that some of the competitive funding is going to those other parts of the state that aren't getting as much formula funding. Okay, so in total, the organizations, these 23 would get on average about 80%, 79% of their budget request. And staff did ask each of them um, how they would need, whether they would need to adjust deliverables, and if so, how, for these recommended figures and have heard back from them um, that the project either could keep the same deliverables or it would be sort of a proportional decrease in deliverables. So if it was like a 10% cut, it'd be a 10% or lower decrease in deliverables. And that's commensurate with sort of what the committee and the commission have authorized in past funding cycles. Chris, excuse me, there's one hand up. Um, Great. Uh, Joseph, do you want us to go back to the previous slide, Joseph? Well, I had. I actually have three questions. It's a fascinating topic and a great presentation. So thank you. And I'm not sure if it makes sense to interrupt it. But my first question was, if we go back to the prior slide, we you had mentioned that there were the applications were for 33.8 million total, but there's 19.5 million that's being distributed. So how did what explains the different number is my first question. That's great. Yeah, actually, I'll, on this slide, I break it down here for you on the right. By the way, um, my audio is, is kind of off. Um, can you all hear me OK, or should I turn off my video? I can hear you fine. It's OK. It's OK. It's OK? Yes. All right. Just let break, me know if you want me to turn off my video. You're breaking up somewhat. Um, let me stop my video and see if that helps. Um, OK, I turned off my video. Maybe it's a little better. All right, fingers crossed. Okay, great question, um, Joseph. So yeah, I, I was, went back to this slide because I put it in bullet points on the right. Like you can just see it in numbers. So to, um, the, there was a um, thirty-three million eight hundred thousand ish um, request in total. If you look at all thirty-four applications combined, including the ones that weren't recommended for funding, um, and then if you look at the and we are, and we know that there's nineteen million five hundred thousand dollars available because the statute sort of tells us how much is available. And if you look only at the twenty three that are recommended for funding, um, their total request combined is twenty five million two hundred nine thousand nine hundred and seventy eight. So there was still a shortfall of available funds of five million seven hundred nine thousand nine hundred seventy eight. So the scoring team and then the committee had to figure out how to cut. Where, where, you know, to how to spread that shortfall across all 23 proposals. Um, and so on this table, you can actually see this is by in order of score from from highest scoring proposal to low scoring proposal, just looking at the top 23 that are recommended. And you can see in the third column, it was what they asked for. And then the fourth column is right. the amount of funding recommended. And you can okay, see- Okay, so the 34, I'm sorry to interrupt, the 34 million was the amount requested, not the amount available. Mm -hmm. all that's right. right. I, yeah, yeah all that's right. right. Yeah. Then like but, Emily, Emily Latella, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and then, um, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, you had two other questions. Go for it. Right. If that's okay. So you've talked a lot about underserved communities, and I'm trying to understand what that means, because all homeless 
people are in some sense, I guess, underserved. Does that refer to the the community where the homeless reside, or does it refer to underserved homeless individuals or some something else? Great question. Um, so the statute, unfortunately, the Budget Act, um, didn't um, elaborate on what underserved meant. So it was left to the commission and the committee to interpret that through the creation of the scoring rubric and the request for proposals. And I actually don't remember or have in front of me the exact wording of the explanation for underserved, but the committee adopted um, an explanation that was something like, and Danielle, if you happen to have it up, um, I'd love for you to share it, but it was something like um, the underserved was, it, it recognized that those who are very, very low income are already um, underserved vis-a-vis -vis their access to civil justice. So it mm -hmm. asked the applicants to articulate one or more additional dimensions to, to income. So not just that they're low income, but um, left it up to the applicants to come up with any other persuasive um, dimension or dimensions that indicated a lack of um, access or barriers to access to civil justice. Danielle, do you happen to have it? I was going to buy you time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. So in the RFP, um, excuse me, uh, for focus on underserved pop populations, it says applicants should describe any focus on particularly underserved clients. A project that focuses on such communities should explain how the latter face even higher barriers to accessing civil justice than does the low income community generally. Since focus on rural populations is a separate criterion, focus on underserved populations refers to other aspects of community access. So examples of what this looked like when we were actually reviewing uh, project proposals included if they were um, proposing to serve um, veterans or survivors of domestic abuse or elder abuse, or if they were proposing to primarily serve uh, Native American clients or clients of color. Those were some of the dimensions that we saw, but we didn't specifically outline what those needed to be other than um, it needed to go beyond being low income. And also um, they could not use the fact that a client was in a rural area as um, kind of the underserved dimension since that was already in another rubric category. All right. that, that's very helpful. And, and, and you were at way ahead of me and very thoughtful so, so thank you I, I i saw legal aid of marin on here so i figured it wasn't just where they are because that's definitely not an underserved community all right I, i'm taking up too much time but my third question if you have time to speak to it is what are they doing generally i mean this is such an intractable problem the state is spending millions and millions of dollars on it with no apparent visible benefit that overstates it, but, but limited benefit. And so I'm just kind of wondering what, what are these various organizations proposing to do specifically to tackle this intractable problem, if you have time to speak to it? Yeah, that's great. Well, what I'll do really quickly is um, uh, I'm going to tab back. We're going to um, describe like three or four of it for, to you as an example, but um, but to give you a slightly more comprehensive response, we checked, so I, I tabbed back to the slide that had um, what the Budget Act requires uh, the grantees to do with the funds. So the scoring team checked to make sure that they spoke explicitly or they described explicitly in the application at least one of these um, clauses. So I just call them hooks. This is like their hook they need to hang their hat on for funding. Um, uh, and if they chose that last bullet point, homelessness prevention generally, it needed to be a very clear nexus to homelessness. They needed to be very express in their narrative about how the legal aid they were proposing or the legal support center service they were proposing uh, would, would directly and meaningfully ameliorate homelessness in California. So most, of, we'll give you a couple examples in a moment, but most of them were the very first two words you see, eviction defense. Um, there was, um, uh, I think maybe, uh, I might be misremembering this, but there were a couple foreclosure preventions. There was at least one or two um, assistance to victims of domestic violence who, would otherwise, who could otherwise be displaced. Um, a fair number um, uh, talked about habitability issues. So that's the second bullet point. 
And then there were a lot that addressed the one, two, three, fourth bullet point, which we call income maintenance. So it's uh, public benefits advocacy, focusing on people who are at risk of homelessness, whose incomes are very, very low and may, or, and or to get any other sort of um, risk of homelessness feature um, who, who qualify for one or more public benefits to help them get that income mm. to stabilize their housing. And for even those, even though that's in the statute as being allowed, we still looked to make sure that they described a homelessness prevention like focus mm -hmm. that they would the outreach would be focusing on homelessness communities at risk of homelessness that sort of thing um so we really tried to make sure it was what we call it, hp um driven. right so it, and this will be my last comment on it I, I promise so it sounds like a lot of this was was not to help people who are already homeless but instead to prevent people from becoming homeless in the first place the, um, the the way the statute is worded actually is very is very like uh, prevention and it's vernacular it's very prevention focused but um, the past iterations of HP awards and, and this one um, certainly include those who have like fallen into homelessness and right. need help getting out of it and then we do have a couple well maybe more than a couple maybe a handful that said that they would ex they would focus especially on those who are already homeless Got but it. a lot of them were sort mm -hmm. of um, uh, preventing homelessness okay. for like current tenants or homeowners. Great, great, great summary, and I'm going to shut up now. <laughs> Thank all, you. All the, projects, this... all the project summaries are are available for the co commissioners to to read. Also, um, Chris, you should I... tell us if we should be can... letting you guys get through the slides uh, and then hold the questions. You and Jim can let us know how you'd like to move forward on this. It... If, if I could just add something here real quick. Sure. A comment was made about Marin County. Uh, yeah. We use the definition of rural as uh, census tracts that are classified by the medical services study area. And every county in the state has some rural census tracts with the exception of San Francisco and Orange County. So that was our definition. There are some areas in Marin. And also a lot of these programs that had a focus on rural like some of the LA programs we're not just servicing the rural areas like the Antelope Valley area in LA, but also other areas in LA. They just had to focus some of the resources on rural in order to qualify for the rural focus. Plus Marin City, just to, I mean, just in terms of educating, Marin City is, uh, is uh, not the stereotypical, um, you know, wealthy Marin, just that's a big part of who Legal Aid in Marin serves. And I, and I suppose, and then I um, <laughs> add on to the pile. The um, it is also a requirement of these grants that the clients meet the statutory definition of indigent, um, which for most clients will mean that they um, are income eligible for legal aid. Although they can also use these grants to serve seniors and and select other communities. Um, so thank you so much, Kim, for suggesting we get through it. This is actually the. I, let me just check. Um, oh yeah, I only have one more slide after this, and that's the resolution. And I wanted to give the committee a chance to share their thoughts. So um, um, I just wanted to flag one thing, which was a quick example of um, a budget that we thought was so conservative that we didn't that it should get most of its requests. So an example of that was Legal Aid of Marin, and I think another one might have been Legal Aid of Sonoma County. So the scoring team looked at those budgets really carefully. We read all of the narratives and we, we really didn't see any um, sort of like fluff in their budget. And so that was an example where because they scored kind of in the middle of the group or even towards the bottom of the, the um, top 23, um, if we had adopted a score driven um, funding approach where like, oh, if you, if you scored in the like, you know, numbers 11 through 15, this is what your percentage cut would be. They actually probably wouldn't get enough funding to do the work they needed to do because they had submitted such a lean budget. So that's just two examples of kind of how we ended up doing the more, I hesitate to call it like holistic approach, but like equity driven or like, you know, um, sort of like budget smart driven approach uh, where we looked at those four or five factors. Um, I see, uh, I saw Catherine's hand come up. I don't know, Catherine, this is a good slide to ask your question. Oh, perfect, because it's on this. So can you just remind me what the four factors are then? Because I, I was just struggling to understand the, you know, some programs got cut by 40% and. Yeah, so the four factors, I just tabbed back and these, these are four like. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, 
bullet points under committee considered among other factors. So this is in no particular order of, of weight, but or importance, but um, essentially, or so the five things um, that the scoring team and the committee um, ended up talking about the most was sort of the proportionality of the project deliverables. And this was this really played out this first one at the scoring team level, the proportionality of the project deliverables to the funding request. So the number of clients they proposed to serve, everyone gave quantifiable targets. Cases they proposed to bring, was it going to be full scope versus counsel and advice to what they proposed um, in their budget. So if they were if they were seeking to serve a lot of people and it was going to be like limited scope and mostly full scope cases, the scoring team and the committee thought that justified a higher amount of funding. They looked at the degree of fiscal conservatism in the budget in light of the narrative explanations. So if it was um, and, and, and drawing on the committees and staff's experience reviewing budgets for other grants over the years. So if they um, if they put a very, very large dollar value in a row of the budget and then the explanation was really lean and it wasn't really clear why they needed that much money to do it that sort of weighed in favor of kind of reigning in the budget a little bit um capacity to implement impactful project with less than the full amount requested this is when staff actually followed up with each of these 23 programs to get their take on it and i would say maybe 25 percent of them maybe that's generous maybe slightly under that maybe 20 percent probably came back and said something like you know we can basically do the same project we'll, we'll we'll just get creative we have some other funding that we can use to sort of um supplement it or they came back and said it, it you know we would and then everyone else came back and said well we would just do kind of like a proportional reduction in deliverables if it's like a 10 percent cut we'll, we'll reduce the number of clients by 10 percent which we thought was fair um, sufficiency of budget narratives and other explanations, just how much detail they provided. And then the, this last one was one that we kind of talked about the, um, the appropriateness of like how to consider this, the comparative size of their HP formula award if they applied for one, because they're not allowed to use it to supplant one another. So it's not as though, oh, they got a huge formula award, they can use some of that, because the statute prohibits that. But rather, if they were getting, this is a good example, there's, there's some, um, uh, larger programs whose qualified expenditures are quite great relative to other providers that are getting multi-million dollar mm -hmm. HP3 formula awards. I think some of them are get $2 million formula, it's $2.5 million. And then there were a few providers that are getting the bare minimum HP3 formula award. The statutory floor was $150,000. And so we wanted, you know, if a provider was getting a multi-million dollar award. We, the committee, um, and it was maybe otherwise a very well-funded provider compared to other uh, smaller programs, the committee was more willing to cut a little bit from their budget rather than cut from one that was getting a $150,000 award and maybe serving a particularly rural county. I don't okay. know if that was too much. I'm sorry if I talked too much no, about no, that. It, <laughs> I went overkill. That that was helpful. And it, I, I would just appreciate getting the summary that Kim mentioned of the proposals. So whoever can send that, that would be great. Thank you. Um, yeah, actually, so the, um, uh, Daniel, do you happen to, um, uh, I don't know if it makes more sense for you maybe to share it with everyone or, or maybe Duan can forward it to everyone in this meeting or I can do it while. I, yeah, I don't need it. To, like, do you want it before we vote or? No, I just. Oh, I, okay, okay, great. Oh, then there's just it, my own education at right, some right. point. So, great. Oh, I can do it then right after the moment. vote. I'm happy to do it. Um, okay. Um, okay, so just for the policy outcomes and then I'm going to turn it back to Danielle for, um, to describe a couple of the projects. Um, the, rec the 23 recommended projects all articulate a clear nexus to homelessness prevention. Um, they propose a strong, it, it is the scoring teams in the committee sense that um, they all propose a strong impact on homelessness in California as indicated by their impact score, but there are other dimensions of impact, um, but that was a particular row of the rubric. They um, mostly focus on rural. So 19 of the 23 have a very express focus on rural and got points for that in the rubric. Um, and all of them got points for focusing on underserved communities. So that kind of checks that box in AB 164 that says that those projects have to get preference. Together, they would serve every county. And I do want to caveat that with five of them um, are statewide 
excuse me, four of them are statewide support centers. So they would serve every single county. So if you take those out, the, the QLSP ones would focus on 24 counties in particular. There's a map and attachment E that shows those particular counties. Um, you can see that it is sort of rural um, or rural urban mix California driven, which we think was probably what the legislature was going for by having preference go to rural, um, app, uh, rural proposals. Um, and although the map sort of, um, sort of like makes it look like Northern California is not getting any of the funding. Um, there's two things to point out there. One is um, some of our, we had more people apply, more programs apply in SoCal than in NorCal. And this is in, this funding stream is in conjunction with the 75% formula grants. The Most of the funding is going out by formula, which means that every county in the state is actually getting it's, it's uh, sort of like fair and, and generous formula allocation of this funding. So this is really just the concentration of this 25% funding stream. Um, and it balances QLSP and support center intervention. So 19 of the 23 programs are QLSPs, Qualified Legal Services Projects. Again, those are like the direct legal aid providers and four of them are support centers for the legal aid providers. Nearly all of them scored and exceeds expectations in at least one category, most of them in multiple, um, or they got five to 10 points in special consideration and um, since it's been a few slides since we showed you the rubric, special consideration gave points for um, partnerships, which the legislature um, said it had a particular interest in, um, and also um, evidence-based interventions, which is a federal funding preference. Um, if we have time, Jim, Kim, and Duan, we're prepared to, Daniel and I are prepared to describe two or three of the projects to give you a sense of what they were like. Um, but otherwise, it was, I was going to turn it back to the gym and the committee members to see if they wanted to share their thoughts. I wasn't sure how much time we had left, though. So I just wanted to check in about that. I, I think we have time uh, to do two or three. Um, Juan, do you agree on that? Uh, I think if you're amenable, then um, to get a flavor of kind of the projects, that, I think that might be helpful. Okay. Uh, Danielle, would you, like to, would you like to kick us off with? with two of our higher scoring ones? Sure. Yes, so uh, one project we wanted to present briefly was inner, from Inner City Law Center, which was actually the highest scoring project um, once we went through the rubric. So the Inner City Law Center is a QLSP and the project that they propose is actually statewide. I believe they were the only QLSP, um, at least among the recommended projects um, that had a statewide focus um, and their intervention is a statewide web-based eviction defense tool that would allow clients to file responses to eviction notices and also connect them to local organizations that can give them um, more personalized um, eviction defense support and resources. And with that online web-based um, statewide tool, they aimed to reach 2,500 um, clients or folks in the state. Uh, in addition, they are planning to provide full scope representation eviction defense in LA County specifically. And they are, they have two partnerships, both are uh, non IOLTA funded organizations. One is called the Debt Collective and the other is Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability. Um, and so again, this is a statewide project and it was a highest scoring project uh, that, we, that we saw and reviewed. And then the next one is California Indian Legal Services, which scored an 86, which was the second highest scoring project. And it is also from a QLSP. The counties served are Alpine, Inyo, and Mono counties. And the intervention, the project is called Remote Eastern Sierra Tenant Project or REST Project. They have 15 partners, um, mostly community-based organizations, and the, the intervention is expanding housing legal services, including full-scale eviction defense, into the Eastern Sahara via remote workstations. Um, and these remote workstations in these rural areas gave them particularly high scores in the focus on rural populations um, part of the rubric. So in addition to the remote workstations in rural areas, they are also partnering with urban Indian health organizations to offer eviction defense resources, limited representation and referrals 
Um, so partnering with established community-based organizations to do um, outreach and client identification um, for Indian and Native American clients specifically. Um, and finally, there's a component of their project that is focused on advocacy um, at the count county levels um, to correct deficiencies in or improve generally some general assistance programs. Um, so it also has that benefits hook, um, working with clients to get um, the benefits for which they're eligible. I turned my video on and the off chance that maybe the problem has resolved. So just let me know if I'm breaking up again. But uh, just two more is um, I just picked um, two that I thought were really really interesting and that I felt a lot of energy around the committee meetings um, or and or scoring team meetings. So Inland County's legal services um, is proposing to, they, their service area is Riverside and San Bernardino counties and they're proposing, and this is, it goes back to Joseph's question, they're proposing to focus their services on people who are already homeless and living in the high desert with an emphasis on um, those, well, I mean, I think they, they just, observe that people who are already homeless um, often have um, mental health and substance abuse issues. And they actually did a very persuasive job of describing what it might look like to have a home, an already homelessness um, uh, focus, like homelessness community focused project where they have, they lack access to certain technologies. They can be hard to find, they can be hard to stay in touch with. And you might also have to help them um, you'd be a little bit more hands-on in helping them if they're struggling with some of those other issues. Um, and they, they propose a really interesting intervention that they call their mobile access center, where they would literally like drive their advocates out to these communities to try and provide in-person assistance um, with a focus on the more remote parts of the high desert. Um, and they describe a very smart partnership with a local provider, Step Up on Second, which serves San Bernardino to make sure that they can also capture that um, that municipal area. And then I also wanted to flag, my other one I wanted to flag through is Public Law Center. Uh, they focus on Orange County. Um, we thought this, and the, the committee thought this project was particularly interesting and unique because it would focus on low-income mobile home owners, specifically with, who are experiencing, uh, I guess what in uh, mo mobile home um, uh, resident mobile home park owner relations is called failure to maintain issues and also unlawful detainers um, with a focus on the Latinx and Vietnamese American communities um, that have limited English proficiency. And they described a really comp compelling project. Um, and even though it would only be focused in Orange County, um, there was no other project that had such a, such a compelling niche focus. And it was, they did a very persuasive job of describing it. So the two I picked. So that's just to give you sort of a sense. I would say all 23 of them are like that. <laughs> the, um, they're all very interesting, very homelessness prevention driven. Um, um, and, and we're all very, very thoughtful in all of their application responses and scored, it scored strongly on the rubric. So I think staff has probably talked to answering your future questions. So I'd like to turn it back over to Jim and, and the rest of the committee to share their thoughts, their reflections. Um, with their, with their fellow commissioners. Well, thanks, Chris, and thanks, Danielle, for a very uh, comprehensive report. Um, I just wanted to add a couple of comments um, as a result of, uh, of this particular uh, granting process. One is that we suggest that they uh, change the wording for the next uh, request for proposals that we change the wording on evaluation as suggested by Eric in the partnership grants. Uh, two, uh, the, this a unique uh, process, uh, part of this grant um, was the focus on by the by the legislature the stress on uh, partnering with uh, non state bar funded agencies, and um, and that was one of the reasons why the timeline got crunched. Um, but we would request in the future that request for proposals would require more details on how these partners are gonna spend the money allocated towards them because some of the proposals were kind of scant on details on that. And then finally, um, as noticed by Joseph on this issue of underserved groups, that the future request for proposals be a little bit more elaborate in terms of describing those groups. Some of the proposals were very good at that, but a lot of the proposals relied on the typical a black indigenous people of color type language without being more specified on that. And we would request that. And then, and then finally, the other unique part of this 
these proposals was because of the compressed timeline that we didn't follow the normal process by which the committee is subdivided into subcommittees, uh, each covering a certain proportions of the grant. Instead, we had the um, scoring meetings and then we had the scoring committee, which was comprised of myself and staff. And since this is a different approach, and I know there was some comments by committee members at the end that they felt a little bit less involved, that we ought to really address these different um, competitive grant procedures in terms of uh, different approaches and kind of discuss them in terms of efficiency, measurement, reliability, and measurement variability. Because my experience on using both types of processes, we do get different results in terms of those issues of efficiency, reliability, and validity. And I'm sure other members of the committee have some comments on that. Uh, Bob, Bob has his hand raised. Bob. Thank you. I want to support the idea of um, clarifying the language um, because too often people with disabilities, despite being a legally protected class, are left out of the discussions about diversity, left out of the discussions of homelessness. And we also are a massively ill housed comp, uh, population. So modifying, clarifying the language, um, as uh, Commissioner Meeker suggested, I support that for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Chris, do you have additional slides? Sorry, I just caught on mute. The next slide is just the resolution, so. Okay, um, before we move to that, um, addition, Will, thank you. Thank you, Kim, very much. Um, I just had one kind of broad question. And before getting to it, I did want to respond to my fellow member, uh, Joseph, on the housing crisis, which is a, an issue very near and dear to me. And it's as awesome as this work is, and this presentation has been excellent in explaining all of the work, it all, it feels a bit like trying to bail water out of the Titanic using solo cups. Um, until zoning is fixed throughout the state of California, there's just going to be a housing crisis. And I'm glad that we're doing what we can to protect the people who really need it if, when they can, but ultimately they're not gonna have the money. So that's rough. And to my question, um, could we talk a little bit about the evaluation process here and whether it, in, what is that gonna look like? And does it include outcomes like, did we keep people in their housing or avoid being homeless? Is that going to be part of that evaluation process? And how does that work? Because that's the other, th these are all great plans. The other half of it is execution and what are the actual outcomes? Great question. So uh, yeah, that, thank, thank you for, for phrasing that. I don't know if Juan and, and Chris both want to respond to that. Chris, were you uh, about to? Yeah, yeah, well, I, I was I'd happily defer to you. I was going to say the the committee is planning where the staff plans to convene the committee in January to talk about HP3 evaluations, in part because this is of all the HP grants, this is the first one that's supported by federal dollars. So the federal government has actually asked for particular results from the evaluation. So we anticipate using this opportunity to also change HP2 evaluations. So they're very similar. Um, currently, it looks very similar to annual reporting for like the equal access fund grants. So it's it's the, the outcomes we emphasize are the homelessness prevention ones like housing opportunities and, and income maintenance. Um, we kind of like ask the programs to sort of focus on those legal outcomes, but the, the sort of information we collect, the narratives, the outcomes, they're, they all are, they're otherwise very similar. So I would just say it's wouldn't currently it doesn't look like a great departure from what we currently collect as part of our annual reporting. But Duan, I totally defer to you on this. Yeah, and, and I'll just I'll just say because um, we haven't done a great job at kind of um, aggregating the data, data I'm presenting to you, but that that is forthcoming. Um, that we actually collect a lot of outcomes and outputs um, from 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 our, our projects. And um, we're sharing report um, from the um, homelessness prevention, the first tranche 
of, of the, that grant to the Judicial Council in a report this month. And then once they sign off, then we'll share it all with the commission as well as the legal aid community. So we're hoping to unveil that data for you all in the next month or two. Um, so you have a sense of, of you know, how the funding is being used in a quantifiable kind of matter. How many clients served, how many um, households um, where there was an eviction prevented soft landing. Um, there's an economic, uh, we, we aggregate the economic impact um, and, and so I think once you, you see that, it, it'll, um, it, it will be less abstract and kind of what we collect, but we do collect a large amount of data. Yeah, I think you bring up a really important point, Will, because we want to see that the dollars are spent well. We want to see if there are best practices, if there are projects that can be duplicated. And of course, we want to let the funding sources know that, um, the dollars have been used effectively. So I, I think it's very, it's a very important thing. And of course, you know, you see the evidence-based language in there, which is, rel I think, relatively, relatively new in, in, in our, um, in our documentation. So um, Eric, and then any. Bonnie also comments? had her hands. Kim Bonnie. Oh, I'm sorry, who? Bonnie, Bonnie. Oh, Andy. Bonnie. Okay. Okay. Um, Eric, and then Bonnie. Yeah, not, this... I can't see everybody. <laughs> Just a quick question for Duan. When is the aggregated da data that you just referred to going to come out? It's 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 finished. So it's now just a matter of like um, it's going through internal review now, and then we're going to submit it to the judicial council. And once Bonnie signs off on it, we can send it over to you all. And then we'll have a presentation. We're hoping to have a presentation at the next commission meeting because some of this will um, in context. I mean, the the, the report is fairly. Um, lengthy. Danielle and Chris worked on it. It's a 30 page document includes lots and lots of attachments to it. Bonnie. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I, oh, she froze. Bonnie, your sound is coming in um, muffled. I think she froze. I guess I wanted to clarify a couple of things. The evidence services that we have is full representation and unlawful detainer um, in uh, housing cases. So we'll We'll be tracking that, but I think the bar has done a really good job of, about identifying and the community identifying potential outcomes are. And I think we're coming at it in a we've been able to do before, which I appreciate. Um, and the course is that we don't necessarily know in some situations if there was advice and counsel, if somebody called, you know, when it worked, what early, what the outcome is. And we probably won't know because those cases are confidential. Um, but we have a lot more data than we've had. And, um, and I think much more than I served, you know, a thousand people with this assistance. Juan? And I just want to add one more thing about the HP data that's really exciting. Um, this is the first time that with any of our grant programs, we're able to collect outcome um, measure, measures um, on a county zip code level. So we can say for you, for instance, um, in Sonoma County or in Los Angeles County, um, this is what was achieved rather than staying in the aggregate across California. Um, so, so that once you see that data, I hope that you'll be as impressed as we are. Um, by by <laughs> the sheer amount and and what the what we can analyze because of the body of data that we have. Uh, Will, just really quick, is there anywhere I can go to see the number of UDs that have been? I'm, I'm not sure what the <laughs> it resulted in a negative outcome for the 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 tenant. You mean for, for the programs that have received funding. For, for them or even for the state or county? Does that exist no. anywhere? No, we really don't have it. And I'm sorry, I'll just answer part. I mean, part of the challenges that, you know, those cases are generally confidential, at least for a certain amount of time. And secondly, in terms of how court keeps track, um, it's really based on whether the um, judgment was for the plaintiff or the defendant. And so what legal aid is normally able to do are more soft landings. People, given California ran a law, at least until COVID changes, and we'll see how that impacts things. Most people move out. The question is, do they have time? 
Um, can they avoid a lot of back rent, those kinds of things, but, but we do not have a lot of data um, from the court system about this. So. Thank you, Bonnie. Okay, Chris, Chris uh, and Jim, can we move on? Are we yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Subject to Jim's permission, I can sure. move on. The, um, so let's see. the The resolution. Um, the this is, I think, the same resolution that's in the memo. Except all I did was just I. I think I added at the very, very end a very explicit reference. So I realized it was, it, I think originally it said like as in the in the memo it's like um, as described herein. So instead I just specified in staff's December thirteenth memo dot dot dot. So I'll read the whole thing. Should the commission concur with the committee's proposal, passage of the following resolution is recommended. Resolved that the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission recommends the 2022 through 2024 homelessness prevention competitive grant recipients and amounts as described in staff's December 13th, 2021 memo for agenda item 7A, and that's discuss and approve 2022 homelessness prevention competitive grants. Moved. Second. Okay. okay. Take I'll a vote. Do, I'll do roll call. call. Okay. Rhinus? Yes. Savage? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Vanarelli, Aguagi, Asaraf. Amin, are you on now? I yes, I am. Know. Sorry about that. No problem. <laughs> I, I am yes and abstain for um, Le uh, Legal Aid Foundation of LA. Okay, thank you. Ball? Yes. Fightmaster Bennett? Yes. Blakemore? Yes. Boschelli? Yes. Connolly? Yes. Friedman Galkin? Yes. Iskin? Yes. Cruz? Yes. Lee? Joseph Lee? Joey Salon? Mahoney? Yes. Mann? Meeker? Uh, yes, abstain uh, with regards to Public Law Center. Thank you. Planto? Yes, abstain for Bay Area Legal Aid. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you. Um, are people interested in having a break for about eight minutes? It's 11. 12 now by my clock and I wonder can we take a break and be back to start at 11 20. Yes please. Okay. <laughs> Gretchen, and run. Okay. okay. And just as a reminder that we're not going to uh, present on the next agenda item that was under seven seven B so you can go to eight because seven B will be carried over into the early 2022. Okay so please uh, return at 11 20 and we'll start back up. Thank you everybody. Thank you. I tell us people are oh here we go. Okay, thank you. All right. Um we are on agenda item eight. Um Amin, are you here? Uh oh. I, well, I am here. Dan, you, Dan, um can you hear me? Oh, there you are. Yes, and we can see you. Thank you. So you and uh, Dan are up on rules committee. Okay, so I, um, we've had a very active year and I'm, I'm happy to report that we have, uh, we've been moving forward very um, uh, efficiently and expeditiously. And I wanna thank all those who, who are on the committee, on the rules committee for the work that they've done. And, You'll hear a bit about our work plan and about some of the things that we have to present for the commission's um, consideration and vote. So I'm gonna turn it over for that substantive discussion so we can kind of get that started and, and um, work through it. So thank you. Duan, did you wanna? So yeah, Dan will, Dan will present on behalf of the password exchange and then I'll, I'll do the work plan um, after Dan goes. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I, uh, I want to um, echo what Amin said. The, the um, committee has been really, really uh, busy. And uh, this is, I think, a, a great example of um, 
work that may not have looked efficient because it took two years for us to get to this point, but it took us time because um, there are some subtleties that uh, our working group um, worked through with us and made sure that uh, the presentation, uh, the recommendations um, were comprehensive and, and covered the territory that they needed to cover. I also want to thank um, Selena and, uh, and everybody at LAC for making sure that we got input from the whole community uh, and that um, we were addressing their concerns and not raising any new ones with these ideas. And with that, um, <clears throat> let me uh, briefly share my screen. And um, I hope that uh, you feel free to uh, ask questions as we go uh, because some of these issues are um, a little technical, but I'm glad to say that we're gonna talk about them both together. I think they make a lot more sense together. It's passed through expenditures and exchanged funds. These are two different kinds of financial transactions that have created challenges for the trust fund program because of the way some of our um, rules and statutes have been written. So let's uh, have a quick look at, uh, can I move to the next slide? It's not letting me. Oh, here we go. <laughs> our, um, our agenda for this conversation is first we're gonna talk about the basic uh, rules and uh, the key terms that make a difference in this conversation. We'll talk about what we're currently doing uh, with respect to uh, pass-throughs and exchange funds and uh, why it uh, is a challenge and we have to take special steps with respect to them. Then we'll talk through uh, each of those individually to describe uh, what kind of changes are appropriate, what we want to do about it, and have a chance to have a conversation. Uh, very briefly, uh, this is our, our basic authorities structure. Um, I'll start actually with the second one, the, the QLSP funding formula. Uh, the gist of this is that um, QLSPs that have larger qualified expenditures uh, qualify for larger shares of the funding uh, in the counties where they provide services. And uh, it's determined uh, based uh, compared to the others that serve that same county based on their uh, total budget expended uh, and the, uh, the representation of indigent persons is the budget, uh, expenditures attributable to representation of indigent persons is the budget of the program. I, I bring up those words particularly because we use them again in State Bar Rule 3.671, which is our primary purpose and function rule. This is the rule that we use to determine whether or not an organization can be presumed uh, eligible for our grants. And we use the same language again, budget and expenditures. Uh, it all depends on, on the finances in the end. So here's how it looks in practice when we get an application. We look at the organization's budget and expenditures in total up here at the upper left by looking at their audit or their you know, fiscal review and their total corporate expenditures. But then we do pull out some things that clearly don't belong there. For example, organizations sometimes write off a uh, bad debt or they'll um, identify the monetary value of pro bono services or in-kind contributions. That's not part of their budget and expenditures the way that uh, the, the funding formula anticipated. So those numbers are pulled out uh, from the organization's expenditures. And along with that, we pull out money that the organization received from a third party for the sole purpose of giving it away to somebody else. This could be in the nature of uh, a subgrant or a fiscal sponsorship or direct assistance grants where you're responsible for paying money out into the community, but it was never part of your own resources and you're not allowed to do anything with it besides paying it out. We call that a pass-through. We don't count it as part of the expenditures of the organization. That happens right at the beginning of the application process. Once we've done that, we can figure out whether or not the organization is eligible for grants by checking its primary purpose and function. 
to do that, we've got to identify everything that's not qualified, take that out, and then come up with a ratio that tells us how much of their budget was for qualified activities. And if it's at least 75%, we presume that they're eligible. If it's less than 75%, then the commission has to review their application. They might need to have an eligibility review conference. They might not be found eligible. So the QE ratio is a very important part of the process. But if you get through that part of the process and your QE ratio establishes that you're eligible for grants, the next thing that staff need to do is calculate the basis for determining the amount of that grant. And uh, that will happen one of two ways, depending on whether you qualify as a support center, which is super easy. We just divide the money by the number of grantees. Everybody gets the same amount. Or if you're a QLSP, and that, says, that process is somewhat more complicated. It requires us to pull out some funding that we don't want to count toward uh, grant allocations. It was a qualified expenditure. It was absolutely the right thing to do in terms of organizational purpose. But for one of three different reasons, we decide not to include it toward grant allocations. And those reasons are uh, either there's a statute that tells us to, and that's Schreiber funds. We're not allowed to because the Schreiber statute says, don't count this toward allocations. Um, we also don't count IOLTA and EAF grants uh, as a, a policy decision that goes back to the very beginning of the trust fund program in the, in the early 1980s. Uh, the decision was made, the determination was made that uh, trust fund grants should not themselves give uh, current applicants an advantage over other organizations. Uh, an organization that gets our grants obviously would have higher expenditures because they have our grant. So we didn't want to put our thumb on the, on the scale in that way. Uh, I will take the EAF grants get deducted before we calculate grant allocations. And the last thing that we deduct is a situation is funds that may have been exchanged between two QLSPs. And we do this because under the funding formula, there's a sort of a presumption that anytime an organization spends money on services, they're the only ones spending that money on those services. And when we calculate the relative shares across all the different counties, every dollar only appears in that calculation one time. When two organizations exchange funds with each other, uh, they're both really spending the same money on the same services. That's a qualified activity for them both. This is something that we encourage everybody to do. They're serving the community, but for purposes of funding formula, both organizations are gonna have higher expenditures. The total amount of services provided is not going up because of both of them. It's only going up because of the one set of services. So all the other organizations in that county will be disadvantaged and the people in that county will get less services than the funding formula anticipated because these two organizations are both counting the same money. It's easily solved. We just ask the organizations to report it. Tell us if you paid one of the other organizations, one of you has to deduct it, tell us which one, We'll follow up and make sure it happens. This way, everybody gets credit for their eligible work, but they only count the dollars one time and the funding formula works the way it was intended. I'm gonna pause here because that was a lot. And I just wanna make sure that we're all on the same page so far. I, I don't have um, a visibility on my uh, slide. So if there's any hands up, please let me know. Oh, uh, Judge Jasper. Uh, could you give me a, a real life example of uh, exchanged funds? I, I don't understand what that means. Sure. Let's say um, a legal services, uh, like a law school clinic, um, has a bunch of students who want to get some uh, exposure uh, on um, doing domestic violence restraining orders. The clinic knows that there's a, uh, the, the law school clinic makes a, uh, a contract 
with another legal services organization that actually is running one of those clinics, please take $5,000 and oversee our students for a semester. Track them, train them, mentor them, and um, they'll come back, you know, better advocates and you'll have some extra help uh, and we'll pay you for it. Uh, when the law school clinic gives us their application, it'll show it an expenditure of $5,000 for that service. And then the, the law school clinic will show that they got $5,000 and spent it on staff costs and on overhead and everything else that was necessary to manage those students. So at that point, they both actually spent the same money providing the same services. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, thank you very much. And Selena, did you have a question? Yes, and Dan, I'm sorry. I ask this question every year to make sure that I remember correctly. And I've asked one recently, but I want to make sure that I get it correct. I know you deduct IELTS and Equal Access Fund grants from the QEs and you deduct Shriver. What, what do you do with other trust fund funding, like the bank, the bank grants, the HP grants? How is that calculated in terms of the, the purposes for um, the basis for calculating grants? Those are included in the basis for calculating grants. Uh, they're not grants that every one of our grantees receive. And the, the formula is uh, adjusted and frequently uh, there's a, a minimum. So programs can get more if they want. Uh, so those funds aren't considered to be the same kind of um, common uh, amount that everybody gets. Uh, only IOLTA and Equal Access Fund are treated in that way. Dwan? Oh yeah, I just want to add, yeah, be, with the striver, I mean, it's by statute that we have to deduct it and IELTS and EF, like Dan said, it's across, you know, all our programs get it, but th there is probably an open question of whether we need to deduct it for our discretionary grants. We haven't been doing it and we probably um, should think about it because there's so much more homelessness prevention money now, um, whether we should deduct for it. And my, my follow-up to that is just clarifying between the QE versus the basis for calculating grants. Um, so the bank grants, homelessness prevention grants, that is that is in the QE or is not in the QEs? Uh, that is in the QE. Basically, yeah. uh, anything that's going to use for calculating grants, used for calculating grants, has to be part of the QEs first. Got it. Thank you. And the reason why I'm asking is that we we report to the legislature the funding that, that happens statewide. And I always want to make sure that I'm not unintentionally double counting or undercounting because they'll say, they have these hypothetical questions like how much more money is needed to fund the justice gap? And so I try to go back and see what are our prior QEs. Um, so thank you for clarifying. I always want to make sure I get it right. Yeah, absolutely. It, 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 you know, looking at, at, at this flow chart, you start with total, get down to QEs, then get down to the basis for calculating grants. So they're, they're, they're progressively um, you know, filtered. Um, so so that, that is what we've got going right now. And Here's why we have a, a challenge to resolve today. Uh, as I said, this statute presumes that uh, expenditures reflect its own services and activities, uh, and pass-throughs don't relate to their own services or activities. Um, they relate to somebody else's activities, and they're the expenditure of whoever gave the funds in the first place. They just pass through the applicant organization. If you count them, and make them deducted as non-qualified, that really torpedoes their QE ratio. If you count it as qualified, it inflates their QE ratio. In either case, it's, it's not an equitable result. Um, for exchange funds, as I said, this is spending the same dollars twice and it, it confuses the statute. So we have developed staff workarounds. Um, for pass-throughs, staff developed a workaround probably starting around 2010. And as of 2018, it was incorporated formally into the application process where uh, applicants identify their pass-throughs upfront as part of their total corporate expenditures. And then they just don't get counted for anything else in the application. We don't count it against them or for them. Um, when we brought this idea first to the working group, there was a recognition that this was useful and that uh, we should try to codify something. Um, 
we learn from the field that there are pass-throughs that require the applicant to have more engagement than we had even understood them to be implementing previously. For example, sometimes grantees get funding on behalf of a donor that wants to do work in a field, but they don't know who to give the money to. So the, the applicant has to pick the, app, uh, the recipients and their grant amounts, but it's never their money and they just pass it through. That should be a pass through as well, although it, our earlier vision hadn't been so broad of it. So our prior rules needed to expand a little bit. Um, the working group also pointed out that um, fiscal sponsorships uh, sometimes require uh, an organization to maintain a, a level of control over what the sponsee does. And I just wanna pause for a second and say, fiscal sponsorship is uh, a term that can describe a lot of different kinds of relationships, but basically it means that uh, one organization is helping another organization get funding that it, it can't get by itself because it doesn't have the proper legal status. So um, one organization might uh, receive a foundation grant on behalf of an unincorporated organization and just make sure that they spend it right, but they're not spending it themselves. Uh, Bob, did you have a question about this? Yes. Um, this is impressive and detailed analysis, and I really benefit from the flowchart approach. What, if any, um, scrutiny has this been given by any accountant? Because it strikes me that legal services providers may not have a uh, professional accountant monitoring everything, or they may not question their accountant about some of this. Do we have an accountant's um, scrutiny of this? Not necessarily approval, but a review of this. Um, the short answer is yes, to the extent possible. Um, and, and I can uh, fill that in in a moment, but maybe at this point, um, we can just kind of uh, show where we, where we went with it. Because I, I can promise you there, there's, a, there's a pretty good basis for what we're talking about. Uh, that's all I need. Thank you. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let's, uh, let's go back for a second. Um, there, there was one other thing that uh, the working group came up with uh, that was somewhat novel, but I, I thought very exciting um, and has been incorporated into the recommendations. Um, the administrative expenses for managing a pass-through um, were initially considered to be non-qualified expenditures, but it became evident that sometimes this work was qualified work. And uh, in those cases, the working group recommended and, and the rules committee uh, adopted the recommendation that those administrative costs be considered qualified expenditures. Um, so it, it's important to have clarity about uh, whether a pass-through is really a pass-through or if it's an exchange fund and what kind of services are being provided and if they're qualified. Uh, and I see a question from, from Eric Iskin. Yeah, just to respond to Bob's question, wouldn't the organization's treatment of expenditures as pass-through or exchange funds be covered in its audited financial statement? Uh, it, it, it is. Uh, sometimes it's something that staff need to look at kind of two or three times because it, it isn't typically the auditor's role to make this determination as to whether it should be classified as a pass-through or an exchange fund. So um, there have been instances where we've uh, wanted to learn more about the funding agreement and understand whether there was a, a specific amount of money that was being uh, restricted or that had to be paid out in a particular way. Um, so the audit financial statement is, is the, the blueprints, but we do need to sometimes do a little bit more investigation to understand how the funds were used and, and under what circumstances. Uh, but then after that process, we will come back every three years and, and do a really thorough uh, fiscal monitoring. Uh, and um, for those who have been through the process, it's been enhanced since uh, last time, uh, you may have seen it done. Fiscal monitoring is very detailed and it does look at these questions as well. Um, 
this uh, tells us that uh, we got some good feedback from the community, but the main point we got from the community was, yes, this is an important issue that needs to be addressed and codified. Um, that was the main message we got both from the working group and the community. Uh, and this is the model of um, regulation that was developed. It looks a little complicated because the goal was to develop a rule that was sensitive to different kinds of pass-throughs. And there's even been some evolution back and forth through this process of whether we needed to have all four sections. Uh, but it looks now as if these are the four and uh, fewer won't do. The idea is that um, we identify all of these four as being a different kind of pass-through transaction and then clarify what we do with them, that they won't be considered part of the budget or expenditures for purposes of determining primary purpose and function or when calculating grant allocations. Um, this uh, then breaks down into parts one through four uh, and each of these subsections describes a different kind of pass-through. Um, I don't know if it's helpful for us to read it at this time because uh, the next few slides break out examples and um, I do think it would be more helpful maybe to just run through what those look like so that um, if there's any questions about the ultimate goal of the wording, uh, we can be more, uh, more clear about that. This is subpart one. Funds received from an outside source, pass-through expenditures include, funds received from an outside source under terms or conditions that require those funds to be paid out to a specified external subrecipient or subrecipients and which allow the applicant no discretion over who receives the funds or control over their execution of the funded work. This is sort of the, passive, the, the classic uh, subgrant. Uh, and the examples would be uh, funder issues a grant for a medical legal partnership and the applicant pays half of it over to the medical partner, doesn't do the medical partner's work, that's a pass through. We don't count that as part of the applicant's budget and expenditures. Uh, or the applicant submits a proposal with five other agencies and the funder specifies how much each agency is gonna receive, but gives it all to the applicant to pay out. That's a pass-through as to the other organizations. The applicant can count the money that it keeps, but the rest of it isn't part of its own budget. If an advocacy organization retains the applicant as its fiscal agent, you know, it hires them to do its back office bookkeeping. Uh, and in that capacity, the applicant receives funds on its behalf and pays it out on its behalf. Those weren't really its funds. It wasn't making decisions about what to do with that money. It was taking orders. Those funds are passed through. Um, and, 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 Kim has her hand raised. I'm not sure. If it's uh, thank you. I, I was, I was going to just try to, to wrap up the, the, the last piece and then um, open up for questions about this one, starting with Kim's. But uh, Kim, is this? Uh... My, my comment is only related to this specific slide. If it's going to be oh. widely cir circulated, I would recommend that you indicate that these four are examples. Um, yes, yes, I agree. I believe that this is going to be called the chart of examples. OK, thank you. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> good, good. Um, yeah, it's certainly not, not, not uh, comprehensive or all inclusive. Um, if a foundation is giving the applicant funding uh, for a particular subject area and the applicant decides to pay some of it to another organization as a subcontractor, um, that's not a pass-through. That's the applicant's own decision and it becomes part of their own expenditures. It's a subtle distinction, an important one, but uh, that's the difference between a pass-through subgrant and a subcontractor. Uh, and if there's no other questions about this slide, I don't think the other ones um, are any more complicated. Um, number two is funds received from an, outside, from an outside source under terms or conditions that require the applicant to identify the subrecipients and the amounts of funds each will receive, but without responsibility for the subrecipient's sub execution of the funded work. That word responsibility means you're not, you don't have to do it yourself, although you may need to report Reporting is not a responsibility, uh, so that wouldn't create a, an issue. Um, 
there are three examples here of um, issuing a grant uh, for workplace safety advocacy with some funds set aside for sub subrecipients. You got to pick those subrecipients and give them those grants. And you and there's nothing else you can do with that funding. That funding is a pass through. Or if the philanthropist asks them to help provide funds uh, to organizations in their field of interest, um, but not if the organization is spending its own funding. If it has its own you know, grant making corpus and wants to make grants, uh, that's wonderful, but it isn't a pass through because it's their own money. Uh, Eric, is there a question? Yeah, several of the HP grants, competitive grants that we just approved involved partnerships. So, uh, you know, like an organization proposed to partner with one or two other organizations to accomplish its home HP uh, objectives. Would that be um, a pass through? Um, it would, I think, largely depend on uh, the extent of control that the um, the applicant would have over the, the subgranted work. So if this is work, for example, that the applicant uh, is responsible for, that would be appear, uh, for example, on the applicant's own uh, CSR and, uh, and reporting materials, if the applicant's really hiring a subcontractor for doing its own work, then it would, I think, appear as, as um, an organizational expenditure and not a pass-through. If this is money that it gets so that another organization can do its work and those services don't show up on its own reporting and it's not responsible for the quality control and, and you know, fly specking, um, it just needs to report the funds got spent, that would look more like a pass-through to me. Dan, can I can I can I um, add a little bit of clarification to Eric's um, question? So, you know, with with HP funds, um, the, those lead grantees are going to be required to report in the aggregate, and it says in our grant agreement that they are responsible for kind of overseeing that um, the outcomes are 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 being um, are achieved and the expenditures. So, in that instance, it would be counted as organizational expenditures and not a pass through. Great, that, that's great. Thank you. Go on. Um, the uh, third clause is with regard to fiscal sponsorships. Uh, when the applicant organization is providing funding to a subrecipient that is an unincorporated entity, unable to receive the funds directly, the applicant organization may or may not exercise oversight and control over the subrecipient. This recognizes that there are some fiscal sponsorships uh, that require the applicant to um, essentially sign off on, uh, on ultimate responsibility, but isn't spending its funds and isn't doing the work itself. So um, earlier iterations, earlier office practice had required um, no authority, no control. This clause has been included because that old version didn't recognize this kind of relationship. Um, the uh, the examples include a uh, community group seeking funding for a project uh, that has not completed incorporation. And um, if the foundation will only give them funding if they're incorporated, then um, the applicant can apply on their behalf and give them the money and uh, pass it through to them. The same can happen uh, if you're asking for a city grant or a county grant and working with a local advocacy group that can't manage, right, isn't qualified to receive the funds directly, but can spend them on your behalf. However, in each of these cases, we're really talking about an external organization. That's very important. If we're talking about an internal organization, even if it gets spun off from the organization itself, that's no longer a fiscal sponsorship uh, and money given to that kind of organization uh, if it's the organization's own funds, uh, that would be just a donation and not a sponsorship. The last version, the last type of a fiscal sponsorship, uh, excuse me, of a pass-through that um, we wanted to clarify is uh, the direct assistance grants, which are designed to give 
funding money directly to individuals who are suffering through some kind of bad situation, whether they're survivors of, of abuse or of a disaster, or if they've, um, they need rental assistance, this is money that just goes directly into an individual's hands. If the applicant contracts with the county to issue rental assistance, and the county tells them what the eligibility requirements are and what the criteria are, um, and the organization's just following those orders as it passes out the funds, that's a pass-through. If um, you're giving debit cards uh, to individuals, whether or not they're clients, uh, and um, whether or not you even really know what they do with the funding, um, it's a pass-through either way, whether you know or whether you don't. And uh, as, a, as a contrast, uh, Cypre funding, um, Cypre funding is funding that an organization may receive as the result of the settlement of a lawsuit that had extra money left over that the court wasn't sure where, where it should go and they picked your organization to receive it. That's a, 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 a crass oversimplification, but Cypre money is money that's received earmarked for a particular kind of work. If uh, that money gets spent on individuals, it's not a pass through, it's the organization spending its own Cypre money. These examples were broken out in an effort to help organizations see the subtleties between the kinds of relation, uh, uh, transactions um, but I think it's fair to say that the, the line is not absolutely brightly, clearly drawn in every case. These are situational transactions, and um, we do anticipate that there will be hard cases that require some, some, some thought. However, um, making the distinction seemed preferable, making the distinction clearer and being more intentional about it seems preferable than, than not. So these are the, um, the four types of pass-throughs that were considered. And the request uh, from the, the working group and through the rules committee was that um, these recommendations uh, be submitted to the board of trustees with a request to be released for a 45 day public comment period. If this happens, uh, it would, probably be part of a larger package of other rules that would all go out simultaneously uh, for feedback from the community. Once we learn what could be better about them, we make any changes that need to be made and bring it back to the board, hopefully for final approval, uh, unless the changes were really radical. But this is the resolution asking for us to move on to the next part of that process for pass-through funds. Are we ready to talk about that or should we move into something else or have a question and answer period? I, I think any um, further comments or questions? I, mean, what, can, what? I see William has his hand up. Yeah. Yeah, on um, number three there, the fiscal sponsorships. Yes. Um, this one seems like the most slippery one to me personally, where uh, an organization might exercise a lot of control. I mean, it says it ultimate control over the use of the funds per the funder requirements. And uh, it's very thorny because I, I'm part of a, an organization that did have a fiscal sponsor they didn't exercise any control other than we had an MOU. They collected money for us. They sent us the money. We used it on a specific program. And then we had reporting requirements. Seems like that that's a pass through, but I don't know that that's always the case. And it seems like there's room for what I might call shenanigans. Um, could we, could you just talk a little bit more about that? Maybe I am missing some key piece that would help illuminate. I, I, I think I do hear uh, the, the concern that, that you're raising um, and the issue of oversight and control 
was uh, a thorny one for the working group as well. Um, these determinations are ultimately going to be made by staff. And if there's a question as to whether or not a particular transaction should be uh, a pass through or an organizational expenditure, um, it would certainly um, receive all the scrutiny and review that the rest of the application gets. Uh, but it has been um, our experience so far, which, you know, it's just informative, uh, but, it, it, but it's been informative uh, that uh, fiscal sponsorships um, tend to be with small organizations that are doing their own work and have their own identity, but don't have a 501c3. We've seen uh, support centers in particular um, fostering community projects and then, and then launching them uh, into the community really to positive results. And, and they've thrived on their own. So it seemed that this was a, uh, a gesture in support of a, uh, a structure, a nonprofit structure that has shown good results historically with the, the understanding that every one of these transactions does deserve scrutiny and um, there may be organizations that don't see it the same way as we do, and we'll have to have conversations about it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think it, I think it helps. I think for most of this, it looks like we're going to have to see how it, it turns out and review whether the, the rules make sense and whether when it gets applied, it matches our expectations. That is true, although I think a lot of work has been done up front to ask, what do you think the problems are going to be to, to, to anticipate the problems? Uh, Kim, did, did you have uh, a, a question? Well, I, I just would like to know before we um, vote on the motion, what, what is the form of the, the rule for going out for public comment? I mean, are we, is this what we're seeing here or is there going to be some um, change in what this will look like for when it goes out for public comment? Language-wise, my expectation is that it would be identical, but um, I, I, I do acknowledge that Office of General Counsel is gonna have final word on, on what the final recommendation looks like. The state bar rules as they currently stand may not be exactly the right vehicle for what we're recommending. Uh, so I can tell you what this would look like in terms of the rules that we currently have, but I don't know yet um, what it would look like when it actually gets recommended up in terms of whether there's a different regulatory framework that, that they would propose. In this case, we're talking about um, rule 3.671, which is the primary purpose and function rule. Currently that rule has three sections, uh, one that talks about uh, uh, QLSPs and the 75% presumption. Then it has another paragraph that's just the same for support centers. And then a third paragraph that says, if you don't meet the 75% presumption, you can um, uh, use other means, uh, try to persuade the commission by other means. And the, the proposal at this point would be to um, collapse the first two sections and then to add a, third, uh, a new third section at the end that would describe, um, introduce, uh, different kinds of transactions where the primary purpose rule uh, would involve counting or not counting certain things. Pass-throughs would be included there um, and, and perhaps other kinds of, um, well, expenditure, uh, I, sh I should say uh, exchange funds uh, would also probably fit in that space if, if we build it in that way. So um, under the current framework, it would fit at 3.671, but I don't know what the future would bring. Okay, so I mean, some of this looks like rule and some of it looks like guidance um, by way of example. So, um, you know, I'm always mm -hmm. concerned, you know, it, 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 significant effort went to drafting this um, and getting input. And, you know, obviously I think we want it to be as, as readable as, as possible. Um, so that's, that's my only um, 
comment. Duan may be adding something here to help me on this. Yeah, so 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 what will go out for public comment is obviously um, a version of this memo to come from the Trust Fund Commission rather than from the Rules Committee um, to the Board of Trustees asking to send it out 45 minute public 45 day public comment. The actual rule itself um, that's been redlined that that we will not. Kind of modest modify substantively at all because as you know with the rules committee work it really turns on like a word it could change the meeting and that that word has been 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 refined and refined over the past year so the language itself won't be modified what may be modified when that eventually gets adopted as a rule is, is the numbering. And Brady is working with us on that piece in terms of once we take it up into the state bar rules, what piece it, where, where it will fit. So it might not be 3.6 whatever anymore, but the language itself, what you're voting on today is that red line version that Dan has included in, in the memo itself. So the language okay. itself is not, those examples are not in the rules, um, Kim. It's just, the rule is just the red line version. This okay. background from this memo is going, is it, it will be circulated with the community because a lot of that is guidance, as you say. And it, it feels like that's not, if, if we include it in the rule, Rule, it's going to feel like guidelines it's going to feel it's going to really weigh down the rule so we want to keep the rule at the high level but we want we want to have this the, the you know um the the memo as um as as guidance moving forward so if we we want to look back and how we apply it we'll have this thank you that's 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 exactly what i'd hope to hear thank you no problem thank you Dwan. uh erica yeah um <clears throat> i just uh first wanted to echo uh Dwan and kim i think your point which is we talked about how to make sure the examples are readily available to um, organizations. So I do think they're very helpful in illustrating that. And even if they're not in the rules, like we want to make sure that they're easily accessible. I did want to kind of probe um, Will's question about shenanigans with number three. And I'm just kind of curious what it is you, what what's the scenario that you think is a problem under that? I, 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 partly because I worked on this with Dan and we get kind of into like our own circular rule, but we, you know, I'm just, I understand that the may or may not control and authority and oversight has an issue, but we tried to keep it into fairly narrow circumstances with unincorporated entities and has to come from outside and go through. So I'm just curious what, what is a hypothetical that you're, you're, you're concerned about just partly for my own edification, get kind of other views on it. Yeah, I, I think I'm I'm not as concerned about malicious acts, but the creep where an organization, a powerful organization, can use that control and either change an understanding or revoke those funds and take them back, um, or or anything along those lines where there become there a dispute happens and then. They take the money back, but it's still counted as a pass through, or they use it to, I guess, goose their numbers a bit, um, even though in reality they're exercising that control more than is expected by this rule. I think those are the examples. So, for with my organization, if our fiscal sponsor had come in and said, "Hey, uh, how are you spending this money?" or "We're we're going to withhold this money." until you do X, Y, and Z, and that wasn't part of our understanding. I think that's where I, I read it and go, ooh, what would happen then? Does that make sense? Have I answered yeah. your question? I mean, I guess the question is, if it doesn't go back out, it wouldn't be a pass-through, right? So unless the money actually gets distributed, it can't be counted as a pass-through. Right, Dan, am I, am I wrong on that? But I, I think- Yeah, we're counting expenditures. In, we're counting expenditures. Yeah, like if the money's sitting in an account, like an escrow account, but it hasn't gone back out, it it it's not a pass through until it's like come in and then gone back out. Um, but I, I take your point, which is you know we, we part of this is going to be like having like you said we're going to have to kind of like see how it plays out, right? And I think one of the things that we I'll just advocate for this a little bit is. We took a long time, we got a lot of feedback. And at some point, I think we were kind of in the position of like, we kind of need to put something out because right now we're in a very fuzzy area. We think we've accommodated the concerns of the community and the concerns of staff. And I think we just have to be ready to kind of get some of the feedback. And then, you know, if we're seeing problems, like adjust to it. 
um, and and refine it as we go. But I I don't want to not you know I don't want to not prove these or you know um, or take another year or two because we want to account for every single thing. So that's that's just my little advocacy piece. But I totally take your point, and it's something that we can like keep an eye on in like you know as we're going through like in the uh, review of budgets and stuff. Yeah, thank you, Erica, and I totally agree. This seems yeah. like a great start, and I, I just hope it comes back and we hear what actually happens. And it sounds like staff really is going to probe these, so I'm way less worried that somebody's going <laughs> to shenanigan us. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. And, and Rich, was there a, a further question or comment? Just, just a comment on that. You know, we've been tasked as a commission with the responsibility of being as transparent as possible to grant applicants. And uh, as a rules oriented society, when you do that, you can pave a pathway for folks to redefine certain categories in order to qualify or not qualify, depending upon what they want to achieve. So it's a delicate balance. I think that this work is fantastic. What's been done here is a vast improvement over what existed before, what didn't exist before. And my kudos to the team that worked on this. Great job. Um, th th thank you, Rich. Uh, the, the, the last thing I want to um, sort of say to underscore some of this is um, the materials that uh, are in the memo and that are in this PowerPoint um, were designed to present briefly. But uh, if you have questions, I can show that there's actually a present discrepancy. The, the, the rules as they currently stand are encouraging organizations to look at these funds differently and treat them differently depending on whether they're QLSPs or SCs. And a, um, a step toward better clarity and reducing that, that variance is, is going to, I think, be good for fairness for them all, um, even if it needs further fine tuning as we go. This is a, a great time for us to take some action, uh, I think. Dan, can I request that we move on to the motion? I don't think there's any further comment that I can see. Thank you. Certainly. Uh, the motion is, uh, should the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission concur in the proposed action, passage of the following resolution is recommended that the commission approves the recommendations of the Rules Committee regarding pass-through expenditures as set forth in the December 13 memo to request that the State Bar Board of Trustees release the proposed rule for 45-day public comment period. So moved. I'll second. Thank you. I'll do roll call. Um, Rhinus? Yes. Savage? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Vanarelli, Aglagi, Asaraf? Yes. Ball? Yes, but thanks to the staff. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Fightmaster? Mm -hmm. Bennett? Yes. Blakemore? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Connolly? Yes. Friedman? Galkin? Yes. Iskin? Yes. Cruz? Diana, are you still on? Lee? Lee is back, uh, and I apologize for having to drop, but I missed the discussion of most of this, so I will abstain. Mahoney? Yes. Mann? Meeker? Yes. Plantold? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just work. absolutely terrific work and so much focus and really just careful effort. Uh, Thank I, you. I, I'm very grateful for um, a lot of support we've got from our working group uh, and from the community. And we're on slide 14 of 16, everybody. The, the finish line is just ahead of us. But there's the also the question of the exchanged funds, uh, which once again, we've been requiring QLSPs to deduct as necessary for the funding formula to work properly, but there's no rule or regulation or statutory authority that specifically allows us to do this. Um, the working group thinks that there should be some sort of codification of that process and the community uh, backed them up on this. Um, the, um, the goal is to deduct only as necessary to protect the functioning of the funding formula, but there's also an intention to improve the amount of information that we get about um, these uh, 
exchanges and, and transactions. Uh, because QLSPs have to report on this, we get a lot of information, but it is incomplete because so many support centers are engaged in these transactions or do them themselves. So uh, the working group's recommendation was that the application uh, require all applicants to report on exchange funds and that the deduction should be codified as is currently um, being practiced uh, so that they're only deducted when two QLSPs are claiming uh, the same expenditure for the same activities. Um, that is um, largely where we came up with this proposal um, that exchange funds should be uh, expended for eligible purposes are qualified expenditures for both parties. Uh, if they're both QLSPs, only one may count. Uh, and that without a written agreement, uh, we will um, credit that to the recipient for purposes of grant allocations as we currently do. Uh, that um, IOLTA equal access and Shriver grant funds or other funds that don't count toward IOLTA grant allocations, just in case there are more that show up later, um, should not be deducted and that funds exchanged, exchanged with or by support centers should not be deducted because they don't impact grant allocations. Um, and then finally, that everybody should have to report. Uh, Bob, do you have a question? On B, um, when only one may count exchange funds, how do we know or make sure that they each know, what if each wants to deduct? <clears throat> How do, do we set a priority or a basis for who can count the exchange funds? We don't. We tell them to figure it out, but we do a very careful reconciliation and have actually redesigned the application a little bit to make that data more easily reconciled. But um, both parties need to be, if one party reports exchange funds and the other doesn't, we'll get in touch with the other. If they both report, but the number is significantly different, we get in touch with them both to get them to sort it out. And if they're both deducting it, we get in touch with them both to get them to sort that out. Careful monitoring, thank you. So were the uh, commission to adopt this rule, uh, this recommended recommendation, uh, it would, take the same path as the one we just discussed. Uh, and it would, if ultimately passed, create a statutory basis, or I should say a regulatory basis for a process that has been part of the application since 1983, has never once raised any concern, but that, um, would, that our system would not work properly without. So, um, that was, I think, the, the basis of the Rules Committee's recommendation. And here's the resolution with respect to it. Uh, was there further discussion? Questions? I didn't see any hands. I think we're okay to, for you to go on to read the motion. Thank you. Should the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission concur in the proposed action? Passage of the following, oh, that should say resolutions though, right? Resolutions is recommended. Uh, Resolved that the commission approves the recommendation of the rules committee related to the definition and treatment of exchange funds and will request that the state bar board of trustees release this proposed rule for a 45 day public comment period. And it is further resolved that the commission approves the recommendation that the support center should report on exchange funds in the same manner as qualified legal services projects. This is broken out as a second re separate resolution because that's how it came out of the rules committee. But you saw that uh, in the proposed rule, it's all combined in a single uh, structure. So this is a second motion we're voting on. This is a, a second motion, yes. So moved. Second, both resolutions. Thank you. All right, I'll do roll call. Rhinus? Yes. Savage? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Vanarelli, Aglagi, Asaroff? Yes. Ball? Yes. Right, Master Bennett? Yes. Blakemore? Yes. Boschelli? Yes. Connolly? Yes. Friedman Galkin? Yes. Iskin? Yes. Cruz? Lee? Yes. Mahoney? Yes. Mann? Meeker? 
Yes. Plan told? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Again, terrific job by the committee and by staff. We are going to, I think, um, is Ms. Perez on the line from she, Sierra Lee Foundation? She's she's not yet, um, Kim. Okay. We've got All a right. more agenda. You talking about Amanda Perez? Is she on? Yes, yes she, she on? is as an attendee. Oh, she okay. is on. Oh, great. Okay, I guess you need to promote her. Um, we are going to switch items 9 and 10. And just a brief explanation on um, 10. Um, in previous years, we have invited one or two um, recipients of funds, um, one of the programs, a QLSP or a support center, to just do a very brief presentation so that commissioners um, can understand their work with a, in a little more depth and just to ask questions if they would like and get additional information, which is kind of, kind of make it a little more real. Um, with our packed agendas, <laughs> we kind of let those drop by the wayside, but we just thought we'd sneak in a couple today and see if um, we can make this a regular part of our meetings. Um, we requested that two people speak um, and um, unfortunately East Bay Community Law Center, which is the grant recipients unable to attend, but we do luckily have, have someone from California Rural um, uh, Legal Assistance Foundation. And so um, because of our jamming of time frame, you know, we, we're just going to give her five to 10 minutes, but we really appreciate your, your coming on for us. Thank you so much for the invitation and for the opportunity to meet with you um, and speak about our, our work. So um, CRLA Foundation is um, a statewide support center um, that provides training, technical assistance, and advocacy support to the qualified legal services programs, primarily um, those working with um, agricultural workers and low-wage workers in the rural um, regions. Um, as one of the support centers that does not receive any um, federal funding. Um, we're also frequently um, referred cases um, to us that QLSPs are not able to take because of the federal restrictions against engaging in um, class actions, um, lobbying, and representing undocumented immigrants. Um, so in addition um, to doing our support um, center work, uh, we, are, we are one of the few um, support centers that also um, provides direct services to those um, individuals who are not el eligible for federally funded um, legal services. Um, one of the largest um, areas that we have really um, grown into, um, especially since the last administration, is our um, immigration work. So traditionally, we have uh, provided naturalization assistance. So we've worked with the law school clinics and many of the um, QLSPs to increase their capacity to assist eligible applicants to apply for naturalization. Then when DACA um, was available, we also provided training and technical assistance to the law school program so that law students could assist um, childhood arrivals with applying for deferred action for, for childhood arrival um, um, benefits. Um, under the last um, in administration, because there was such, such an increased um, immigration enforcement and the separation of um, mixed status families, um, we also um, were requested to provide removal defense assistance to unaccompanied minors um, and um, parents who were traveling with children. And there was a threat of them being separated because there weren't as many um, immigration legal services in the rural areas. So we provided that, um, that need. Um, and then you know, most recently also in response to um, the Afghan um, families that have come for assistance with um, humanitarian um, parole. So CRLA Foundation you know, has um, a depth of experience um, primarily in, in labor and employment, uh, rural housing issues, um, rural health, um, bilingual um, education as they affect um, rural communities. Um, and in most recent years, again, in, in response to um, the increased enforcement, we have really um, grown our um, capacity to 
provide removal defense um, and naturalization assistance and DACA assistance um, primarily to uh, rural communities because they are most um, isolated. Um, there are you know, a number of um, clinics and organizations mostly in the urban areas, but not in the rural areas. So CRLA Foundation kind of meets that need. We do that through um, group processing, um, workshops, um, we train students, we take them back out into the communities um, so that they can serve you know, their communities and those that are most um, underserved. And in that way, we're increasing the capacity of those communities um, and our students to be able to meet an unmet immigration legal services need. Thank you, thank you. Questions? Impressive, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Well, it is impressive. <laughs> it's just kind of overwhelming that what you are doing now. I have to admit that I was a law clerk after my first year of law school at CRLA and worked on class certification, but that's about all I remember. I was in the library the entire summer. But um, it, yeah, it's, it's really wonderful to hear the breadth of the work you're doing um, and uh, for the commission to um, directly hear from you um, and understand that our work, you know, we're all volunteers, that, um, that we're help, helping to safeguard uh, programs like yours. Um, thank you. And we also just appreciate, um, you know, the support and, and that ability for, um, programs like ours to um, partner with the QLSPs. And, you know, there are times where we have to join together to maximize resources out in the community. So programs like Legal Services of Northern California, CRLA, CCLS um, can represent those that are eligible for their services. But we know that in all of these regions, there are mixed immigration status families. Um, and so that together we can provide the most comprehensive um, services to vulnerable families and, and communities. Um, our ability to partner with those programs um, really um, safeguards, you know, not only the access to justice, but to ensure that there is um, more equity um, in traditionally um, vulnerable and underserved communities. So we're very grateful for, for that support and, and that opportunity um, to serve these communities in, in partnership with the QLSPs and also with the commission. Any more comments, <clears throat> questions? Okay, thank you for waiting to come on um, at the right time during our, our agenda. So I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to the final uh, Agenda item, which is legal aid grant evaluations. And Sorry, Kim, there's one more agenda item under the rules. Committee, oops, the work oops. Committee. Okay, oh, the uh, calendar. Yeah, and I, we okay. can be quick, Amin and I. Um, let me share my screen really quick. This is also included in your um, packets of materials, but give me a second to share my screen. <laughs> So this is a really detailed um, work plan and I'm not gonna go through the whole thing. I just wanted to point out that for the rules committee, um, we have six meetings, six meetings scheduled for next year. And each of these meetings have about um, one to three kind of topics each. Um, how the rules committee kind of uh, crafts this recommendation is that each of these topics will have a sub working group group. Um, for next year, we're going to try out something a little bit different. We're going to have two um, rules committee member and we're hoping to have at least one um, non rules committee member join. Um, and last year, what we did last year, as well as this year, what we did was um, we, we had some proposed recommendations of who to join the working groups. This year, we'd like to just kind of solicit your, 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 have you volunteer based on your expertise and your interest. So if there's any of these topics, here that might be of interest to you, please reach out and let me and Ami know um, so that we can start um, formulating the, the working groups. And you'll see that there's you know, a date re um, related to um, the committee meeting. The bulk of the work happens, I would say probably um, four or six weeks, um, four to six weeks before 
before that that meeting, um, usually the recommendations start solidifying, the memos start getting drafted. Um, before then, we do some preliminary meetings um, to plan for what the recommendations could be. But I think the bulk of the work is, is around that four to six weeks beforehand. So if you have availability and interest and expertise, um, please do consider volunteering for one of these um, working groups. Um, Amin, is there anything else you want to yeah. add about the work? No. Sure, I, I would just add, you know, first of all, uh, and we're very grateful for those of you who are not on the committee who have participated in the work groups, working groups. It's been um, in incredibly substantive. The feedback uh, that, that you've provided has been really helpful. The discussions are enriched by your contribution. So really appreciate that. Um, I will say for those who have not served on working groups, um, to Duan's point, the bulk of the work is four to six weeks prior, and that usually consists of, depending on the issue, depending on sort of the, the layers of feedback we're getting from the community or from staff or from others, um, you know, one to three meetings prior. Um, it's probably a good, a good estimate of, of the expectation um, and a review of, of work that, you know, the staff takes a laboring or with um, in terms of preparing a report and kind of analyzing the issues. That's really the, the bulk of what we're looking for and hoping is, is to get um, you know, as, as much in the way of substantive thought and analysis on some of these issues. And that's why we wanna you know, sort of open it up if there are issues that you feel that you have a particular expertise or experience or, or background in or that you're interested in, um, we'd like for you to participate in making that choice. So. Uh, so on to let let us know if, if there's anything that you find interesting and um, there will be we're, we're aiming for as much as we can three person working groups um, mostly staffed by rules committee members but um, opening it up to everybody so with that thanks everyone thank you okay um, item nine legal aid grant evaluations um, so 9A, um, th this is from the HP committee. That's going to be um, skipped over, Kim, because um, the committee will be bringing forth. Um, okay, so we need we need Crystal on uh, the next two items. Hi, Crystal. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to uh, be sharing my screen. So Duan, please flag if there's any questions along the way. Of course. Thanks, Crystal. All right, so I'll be uh, talking about proposed updates to the 2022 EAF and about Oh, can everyone see my screen? Hang on one second. All right, so proposed updates of the 2022 EAF and partnership grant evaluations. These are agenda items 9B and 9C. Quick overview of what we're going to cover today, uh, the Budget Act of 2021, which is the, the reason why we're um, having the proposed updates for the EF evaluation and partnership grant evaluations. Um, and I'll start off with the an excerpt from the Budget Act of 2021. Um, there is some emphasis added uh, specifically regarding those reporting requirements. There's a lot of text on the screen, so I'll go ahead and read that out loud. So the state bar shall annually provide to the Judicial Council a report that includes funding allocations, annual expenditures, and program outcomes by service area and service provider for all equal access fund and federal funding. Data shall be reported using the established reporting framework in the equal access program, including applicable outcome measures reported in legal service standardized reporting, state level performance measures, and main benefit scores. The Judicial Council shall provide this report to the Department of Finance by January 1 of each year for the prior fiscal years. So there's a lot, um, a lot just in this excerpt. And uh, just for some context, we uh, we have an EAF evaluation team um, who's comprised of state bar folks as well as Judicial Council, uh, Elizabeth Duan, myself, and also um, Jim Meeker, um, who serves on the commission on the state bar side, and then Bonnie, Melanie, uh, Karen Kanata, and Kim Taita in the Judicial Council of California. So uh, melding of minds of talking about 
these reporting requirements um, as mentioned in the Budget Act of 2021 and how that might impact the 2022 EAF evaluation um, and partnership grant reporting requirements. Uh, they were previewed on October 27th to all of the grantees um, and we received uh, lots of feedback um, especially from support centers, which we're looking to um, enhance those requirements and uh, make it a little bit more applicable uh, to them, uh, as well as the QLSPs. So I'll go through the EAF evaluation and the partnership grants one by one. There are resolutions at the end of each section. Um, just to note, the EAF evaluation changes are more substantive, so it'll go by a little bit longer than the partnership grant evaluations, which follow suits uh, because it's under the EAF funding umbrella. All right, so agenda item 9B, uh, discuss and approve recommended changes to equal access fund grant evaluations. So as per the Budget Act, which that excerpt I read earlier, the 2022 EF evalu evaluation reports must include the following information, uh, funding allocations, the annual expenditures, uh, and then program outcomes by service area and service provider. This is one substantial change um, that was uh, indicated in the, in the Budget Act. Uh, the timeline, the timeframe uh, of reporting a report to the Department of Finance by January 1, 2023 uh, is also a change. So uh, just to summarize the 2022 EAF reporting requirements, they seek information specific to the EAF grants. Uh, currently, the state bar grantees uh, report their program outcomes across all of the funding sources uh, in both the case summary report and the main and economic uh, benefits report. Uh, in order to meet the new reporting requirement deadline of January 1, uh, the proposal um, that we've discussed also with the grantees is that they will now need to submit a mid-year EAF evaluation report uh, in addition to the final EAF evaluation report. I'm going to pause. I know I covered a lot of um, content, so just pausing to see if there's any questions from the commission. All right. Uh, a couple of notes as well in terms of how, how big of the impact is the state, uh, state uh, budget act impact. So the proposed changes will not impact the 2021 reporting. Uh, they'll, still the same, there's, they'll still be the same. Um, and then while we anticipate that the 2022 final EF evaluation reports will be substantively similar to the mid-year evaluation report, we'll advise all of the grantees of any changes um, as we see fit prior to the final report release. Uh, we also wanted to uh, remind the grantees that they can use EAF funds to support uh, the valuations. Uh, and then the 2023 EAF reporting requirements are still pending. And just, just to get a sense of the timeline and what that means now for the grantees for the mid-year EAF evaluation report, uh, mid-year would be January 1 to June 30th. So the release date would be July 1 with a deadline of July 29. Uh, we really considered, the team really considered these dates um, in considering the review process, getting them through the various levels uh, in preparation um, to submit to the Department of Finance. Um, and then the final EF evaluation report would take into account the full year uh, and then be released January 2023 and then March 2023. Uh, Duan, I think I see your hand up. I just wanted to add that um, the state bar and the commission doesn't remit the report directly to the Department of Finance. It'll go through um, Judicial Council and Bonnie who will then um, send it to the Department of Finance. Uh, we also held the, the webinar in, in October. We wanted to give as much advance notice uh, to the grantees. As you can see, the, the release date for this EAF evaluation report wouldn't be until July um, 1, but wanted to give a heads, heads up just so the grantees can start preparing um, you know, for this potential change in reporting. All right. We also wanted to emphasize you know, some benefits of having a mid-year evaluation reporting and what we'd like to accomplish with it. Uh, the first is uh, to increase understanding of how the EAF funds are used. We both wanna be responsive to the legislative requirements, as well as get a better understanding and visibility into the types of EAF activities through um, more streamlined reported outcomes. And that segues into the second goal of the mid-year reporting, which is to streamline how data is collected and reported. So we'd like to leverage 
existing processes and reports that the grantees are familiar with, um, yet uh, adjust them so that they're specific to the EF activities. We want to be able to report back to the Department of Finance reportable and meaningful data, uh, and um, hopefully streamline so that there's less narrative questions, and then we can start talking about things more categorically or topic-based um, through, through streamlined evaluative questions. Uh, just an overview of the proposed changes. This is the outline of the, the mid-year and possibly the, the final uh, EF evaluation report and what it would look like. Um, there are five forms, including a section specific to um, COVID-19. That's something we included for the 2020 uh, EAF evaluations. As you can see, um, we're not uh, proposing of several uh, substantive changes for forms one uh, form and forms five. Form two, which is results and outcomes, is where you'll see most of the changes. Uh, specifically, we want to add questions uh, asking about additional target population groups, want to be inclusive, and we also ask for feedback during the webinar, um, languages that these services are offered, and just more in-depth information of the services summary. This includes um, having a case, su case summary report, uh, main and economic benefits, uh, and then building out the support center services and getting a better sense of the types of services they're providing with EAF funding. Um, we're also adding a section uh, about organizational benefits on how EAF funding may potentially be a benefiting the organization, such as expanding technology, additional staffing, et cetera. Um, in terms of form three evaluation, we're looking to ha have some checkbox questions. There's a lot of narrative right now. Um, that's really just for easier processing and, and again, to be able to, to report this um, more meaningfully to, to, to DF, DOF and the Judicial Council. Uh, because of all the quantitative data that we're requesting for the 2022 report, EF reports, uh, we're uh, also proposing that form four, with the, which are the vignettes, will be an optional section and no longer required. Uh, we'll be uh, maybe asking them if, if that's uh, requested from the state, but uh, as of just to balance out the requirements that we are proposing, we're, we're looking to have that be optional. So just pausing here again to see if there's any questions, thoughts, comments. All right. Oh, Pamela. I'll go back I would just slide. love to have a I would love to have a copy when when we're when you're done. This is excellent. Oh, thank you. All right. So um, absent any any questions or comments, I have a proposal a proposal on, on screen for the recommendation. Um, this is really um, to propose the changes in concept. Uh, I did highlight the mid year reporting, the final reporting, but there, the questions, like the evaluation questions per se, are, are still in progress. We're, we're tweaking them as we go. We don't have a final evaluation to report per se, but it really are these changes that uh, I've highlighted here that where the EF evaluation team is looking to implement for 2022. So, would you attach the um, PowerPoint to the resolution? Juan, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to you for um, that. Uh, you, you mean attach it and uh, post it as public materials, Rich? Is that well, well, I know it'll be posted. I, it will be posted as public material, I assume, right? Well, the our PowerPoints usually aren't. So that was is that is that the question that you? No, I, I'm responding to a, a comment uh, Crystal just made, which is that the reference here to proposed changes is vague. Uh, if you said proposed changes oh. as, as set forth in the attached PowerPoint or oh. attached material, then it would be more specific. Oh, yes, I see what you're saying now. So it's so modifying the, the, the actual language of the motion, Crystal, if you want to do it on live. So That, was that the proposal? That would work for me. I just want to underscore again, even though um, Crystal took out the in concept, um, because some of the questions are still being wordsmith and um, we're building it out on our online platform, Smart Simple. So it, there might be some tweaks, but um, in concept and th that slide that Crystal showed earlier is what we're, we're asking you to approve. So moved. Second. Great, I'll do roll call. Rhinus? 
Yes. Savage? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Vanarelli, Agogi, Asaraf? Yes. Ball? Yes. White Master? Bennett? Yes. Blakemore? Yes. Bushelli? Yes. Connolly? Yes. Friedman? Galkin? Yes. Iskin? Yes. Cruz? Lee? Yes. Mahoney? Yes. Mann? Meeker? Yes. Plantold? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. All right. So second half, this is um, which will be much shorter. Um, this is item 9C, discuss and approve recommended changes to partnership grant evaluations. Uh, very similar to what you just saw uh, under Budget Act of 2021, um, those those same requirements would also apply to the partnership grant evaluation reports. Um, specifically, the mid-year partnership grant, the mid-year and the final reporting is what we're looking to, to update for the partnership grants uh, 2022 evaluation reports, and the timeline would be identical to EAF um, reporting. So July 1, um, and then another release for the final in January 2023. Uh, the partnership grant evaluations are, are much more streamlined and, and, and shorter in comparison to the EF evaluations um, with form forms A, well, form, form A, B, and C, not three, uh, with expenditures, activities, and evaluations. The proposed changes are, are here. Uh, form A would not have any substantive changes. That's, that's really budget information and, and spending information. Uh, form B would just be to include more checkbox questions and streamline the narrative questions um, in line with the EAF changes. And then form C would be to um, also include checkbox and streamline questions. Uh, because the EF evaluation team is looking at all of the evaluations, we're gonna be pulling any questions that will be applicable to EAF in partnership grants. So there's continuity across the, um, the evaluation requirements and reports. So that's that's mostly it for partnership grants. Um, and then the proposed action, I'm happy to um, make a similar uh, edit um, as, as we did for the EAF. Uh, and then I think, Will, you have your hand up. Yes, I, I just had two questions. One, will these reports include the target information that had been put forth in the grant applicant application? Or is yes. it, we're gonna have to pull both and then do the comparison or will it be in line? Yeah, so the, the for partnership grants specifically, I know there's a section that asks for um, anticipated activities, um, as well as the, the number of actual, the evaluation has, pulls that and then also has actual, so you can compare what was anticipated versus what was actually conducted. And then um, there'll be narrative questions as to why there's discrepancies or what had impacted that um, planned number, because, you know, during the grant year, things change, right. um, and then these uh, projects have to adjust. Fantastic. That's mm -hmm. great. And then I guess my other question, and it might be asking you to speak for the California legislature, but I, I guess I'm unclear why this change is good. Does that make sense? What is substantive here that improves the process and the system? And how does it inform decisions going forward? If you could just speak a little bit to that, because I'm, I'm just confused. Or uninformed. Um, let's see. I don't know if Juan or, or Bonnie are yeah. on too. If you wanted to, speak. I, I, I can help. And and um, you know, prior to this legislation, with the EF money at least, um, there wasn't a reporting requirement. We've never been required to submit a report to the legislature. So I think that's the biggest change. Um, because of the, what I think, and I, I, I don't want to speak for the, the legislature, but what I think um, is that because of there's increased funding, so there's more accountability. So they want us to remit a report. Up. Thank you. That's, that's great. And, and I can say this is a part of it is also coming since the federal government is requiring these reports. I think that was part of the thought of, oh, this would be really helpful since, yes, they, I will say they did request a report in 2004, but it's been a few years. So this will be great. And, and you'll see at the, at the next um, commission meeting when Chris and um, Jim present on the HP valuations, it's much more involved because those are federal money. So there's a lot more reporting requirements.
Yeah, so up uh, on your screen is the updated resolution um, in line with the edits just made for the EAF. Um, so uh, we're looking to, to get this uh, reviewed and approved today as well. Again, so moved. Second. Thank Bobby you. Wilpaw. Rhinus? Yes. Savage? Yes. Driver? Yep. Vanarelli, Aglagi, Asaraf? Yes. Ball? Yes. Fight Master? Bennett? Yes. Blakemore? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Connolly? Yes. Friedman, Galkin? Yes. Iskin? Yes. Cruz, Lee? Yes. Mahoney? Yes. Mann, Meeker? Yes. Plantold? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Crystal. I think we are finished with 12 minutes to spare unless anyone has anything <laughs> they want to raise. All right. Thank you everyone for all of your focus, hard work, happy holidays, be healthy, happy new year. Same to you. Here, here. Happy holidays. You in January. Happy holidays, happy holidays everyone. <laughs> everyone, happy new year. Yeah. Bye. 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 All the best. Great job, Kim. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Have a good one.